one cast thing really quick, just because I feel like we we didn't say anything about it, which is Dior getting like minorly canceled. Um, And I have to say, okay, so what happened with Dior, who's the actress who plays Clarice in Percy Jackson currently, is that she, I think she re-uploaded a fan edit. I never saw the post when it actually went up, but the yeah. post contained a word that is a slur, but not really a US slur, um, or at least not in, in my circles. And um, so like, I've never heard the word used in that context. I could definitely see how that mistake happened. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, like, I'm glad she took it as a learning opportunity. Because yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, I um I didn't see the post that she made. I just saw her make like a statement after, and then I was like, "What?" <laughs> and so I found like somebody on here that was saying like that explained what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, that so there was like something similar to that that happened a few years ago with Lizzo, where Lizzo came out with a song that used that word and. It was interesting because like because I'm autistic, I obviously see videos from disabled people. And so disabled people in like England were like really angry about that word and everyone else was like, what? (laughs) And so I guess basically what happened is that word is like a really derogatory word, like the F slur would be here Mm -hmm. um, or like the Arsler, I guess, here for disabled people in England. And so people in England, whenever they see it, they obviously get really upset. And so, but here, like, it's like a word that's kind of used in AAVE sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, like, Lizzo said it, like, Beyonce came out with a song around the same time where she also used it a few years ago. And so, like, I'm not, like, I'm not, like, necessarily like surprised since Dior is also black that she would use it or like post a fan who used it or something, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. Knowing that it was like a slur. And I guess the main thing I just wanted to say about that situation is that I see people online really like, really like, like knocking people down or like being very, I don't know the right word, like very, like almost like corporal punishment about people. Like if somebody does something wrong, they just want to use that to say this person is garbage for the rest of my life and I hate them now. And I want to like, every time they post, I want to bring this up in every post they ever make for the history of their life to make them feel bad. Mm -hmm. And like, don't do that. (laughs) Like if you see them, please think about doing that because, because would you, want some to say something that you realized didn't that you didn't know at the time was something that hurt people and made a mistake and then took it down and apologized for it and then have people continually bring that up to you forever to try to say that you're a bad person when you did everything you could have possibly done to fix it like it's just it makes it a situation where like you're not allowed to make a mistake mm-hmm and if you're in, you're a per, you're a person every person is a human being you're going to make mistakes sometimes and it's not like she was using one that's very obviously something you should never be saying or anything like that it was a situation where she didn't know what she said and that was it and so i hope that people don't turn too hard against her in that way just because since she is a marginalized person that sort of reaction will be even more severe at her because it always is yeah and and things like that and so please don't do that like you can be upset with her for using that word obviously but it's also like can we try to keep this in like context of what actually happened she's not like a bigot she's not like running around the world actually thinking those things she just was excited about in like a very ironic way this is one of those things that I talked about with the cast that they're always kind of playing. She's the one that does this a lot where she, I feel like they're always kind of playing with fire by reposting things that fans make yeah. about them because you just never know how somebody is going to react. You don't. And this is like a, a good example of that. Of like, she probably wasn't looking 
too closely about what what the things she was posting said because she was excited about sharing things that people were making about her song coming out but it's like this is why not having like boundaries with your fans like that can get really weird and blurry because if they feel like they know you then they feel like they can be mad at you when you do things like this in a way like a friend would be mad at you when they don't actually know you and it just becomes really weird (laughs) really quickly yeah exactly and i just thought it was worth mentioning because it really did seem like an innocent mistake and like a mistake that i would have made because i didn't really know about that and yeah yeah Sometimes, like, people on the internet need to be able to make mistakes and apologize for it without being, like, raked over the coals for the rest of their life because they made one mistake. Because nobody wants to live under that sort of anxiety (laughs) of knowing that if you ever do something wrong, then anything you've ever wanted to do in your life is, like, ruined forever. Yeah. Like, that's not helpful in any way. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. um, I don't think there's any other fan news necessarily. I mean... Uh, well, I will say the one thing that I thought was funny in like a very annoying way is we did our whole huge episode about Luke. We spent probably an hour talking <laughs> about how he's not a revolutionary. Oh, and yeah. then Charlie, the actor, does an interview with a magazine where he says, I think Char- I think Luke is a revolutionary. And I think he just he got lost along the way but he just needed to he was just doing what needed to be done and and like in this like interview he's talking about how before season one and then also before season two he would like listen to percy jackson podcasts to like get an idea of like how to play his character and i was like he will never listen to our podcast (laughs) yeah i was like oh my god you will never listen to our podcast and now i feel like i have personal beef with you because now nobody is ever going to shut the fuck up about saying that Luke is a revolutionary. And like the one thing I'll just add on to our gigantic statement we made is that generally, just generally, if you call yourself a revolutionary, but that revolution magically makes you the one in power and everyone who doesn't like you is dead, you're usually not actually a revolutionary. <laughs> like exactly. that's, that's a dictator. Yeah, and um, I mean, he was saying part of the revolution that Luke was fighting for was for there to be no more gods, which, like, I I don't see how that fixes anything. (laughs) Especially because I thought your best friend was Kronos. Mm -hmm. Is is he not a god? (laughs) I mean, technically a titan, but still, the titans aren't any better. They didn't care about humanity either. And, like, the gods are immortal. Mm-hmm. Where are they gonna go? <laughs> like they're never they're never gonna die. It's yeah. so it's like what what revolution is more just like the whole idea of like, oh, things aren't good how they are now. So we should just like wipe everything off completely and murder everybody except for me. Mm-hmm. And like because I obviously have the right idea about how society should work because I'm willing to murder everyone to get what I want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah great revolution yeah. did you also know that what's his face from marvel wasn't right for snapping and making half the general universe disappear overnight for no reason like he also wasn't right killmonger wasn't right either <laughs> like just covering all bases none, none of them were actually right they had reasons to be upset but like being like everyone isn't happy so i'm just gonna kill them all so they're not alive anymore so they won't be sad yeah (laughs) and like really quick before we move on to um so shannon had a little back and forth with somebody i mean it wasn't really back and forth it was you made a couple posts and then they made a bunch of posts about you (laughs) um and it was in relation to calypso because a song from the musical eclipse just came out or eclipse um i'm I'm thinking of twilight in the back of my head (laughs) epic just came out and um like the lyrics really are kind of relatable to a toxic relationship and i feel like a lot of people have been there where you really want somebody that doesn't want you back but um i just want to stress that like when we talk about these characters and their bad actions, we're not saying that they're not necessarily relatable in some way, 
but we're saying that there's a point where the relatability should end. You know, like there's a point where you should examine like, oh, I felt this way, but I'm not, not going to take it that far to, you know, like killing other people that are my peers or to entrapping a man on an island for seven years. Um, yeah, like, like the whole thing with villains is any like villainous sort of character or antagonist or whatever okay. is there's always something about them that is relatable to people because that's what makes a good character like that. If they're just like a 3D weird like cartoon villain they're not there's nothing there for people to get interested in there's always something about them that you can understand or like understand why they feel that way yeah this thing has happened in recent times that i blame jk rowling for for how she wrote snape and that whole situation is that like people have started to do this thing where if they feel like they identify with an antagonist or something they're like, I identify with how this person feels. So this person obviously must not actually be bad. And so they have to actually be the good one because I understand them and I understand how they feel. And so then they like work backwards and find ways to like justify everything they do so that they're not like the bad person anymore. And that's when like media literacy stuff goes like flying out the window. And that's essentially what I was talking about was like, that the song that just came out in epic like there was been songs at least one other song with calypso and odysseus when he first got on her island and he was she was trying to get him to get into literally the line is like get into bed with me and he's like no yeah. and so it's like very like aggressive like a calypso adaptation of her ever would be with when it comes to that and but this new song that just came out is called I'm not sorry for loving you. And I'm like, this song is literally her saying, I'm not sorry for holding you captive for seven years and doing whatever I did to you in that seven years when you were trapped here to the point where you almost try to take yourself out of life because I've like driven you to that level of like insanity that you want to die because you i won't let you leave that the gods like athena literally has to get zeus to let her let him leave mm -hmm. because she won't just let him leave and so the idea that you hold somebody captive for that long for seven years and then you're singing a song being like i just love you too much and that's literally one of the lines of the song is i just love you too I, my love is just too much for you and i was like that is the biggest red flag ever if somebody is ever saying those words in a sentence to somebody who like doesn't, especially because he never wants anything to do with her consistently, like ever. Yeah. Like he never like waffles on that or changes his mind. And so I'm like, if you see that person as like sympathetic because you maybe feel lonely and whatever, okay. But like also understand what's actually going on in this song. Like she's holding somebody captive and then telling them like i don't care that you were upset for these seven years because i didn't get what i want and that's all that that's all that matters so it's like you can understand maybe feeling lonely like that and but like also acknowledge that calypso as a character is someone that always takes everything way too far yeah and that she's basically like the female you know abuser or predator or however you want to put that because that's just how her character is always depicted is not like a it's not like a weird conspiracy that her character is always shown that way because that's just what her myth is and so like it's fine if you un can understand that feeling of being angry when somebody doesn't want to be with you and wanting to get back at them but to the point that you like that person that was responding to me literally made something up about me that i never said like i was the whole stupid thing was they were, they commented on the video when I first posted it right before I went to bed and saw like all these comments and stuff the next day. And a bunch of people underneath her comment was like, what are you talking about? Calypso is not sympathetic at all in Epic. She's still really manipulative. This song is her manipulating, trying to manipulate him. And so she deleted the comment and then came back a couple hours later and was saying things like, she was trying to say, like, are you saying that the person who created this musical is like romanticizing 
essay, like sexual assault, because because of this song. And I was like, no, I'm saying that you are. Mm -hmm. Because like you are thinking that this that she is sympathetic in this song. And so she is basically sexually assaulting him in this song because he she's coming on to him and he can't leave. And so like that's you're doing that. Like you're seeing her as sympathetic in this song. There's nothing actually in the lyrics that give you the idea that you're supposed to see her that way. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to say to her. And she went from there to calling me saying that I called her a rape apologist and made six videos about me within 12 hours. And then when I finally like told her, like got it through her head that I never call, if I'm going to call you a rape apologist, I'm going to call you a rape apologist. I'm not like afraid to call somebody that if I think that they're being like that, like I'm like the one person on the internet that will call somebody that and be fine with it. And so if I'm going to say that about you, I'm just going to say it. But I never said that about you, like yeah. ever. And her response to that was finally like deleting some of the videos she made about me and then blocking me. <laughs> yeah. But it was just like, you are arguing with me and literally making up me being a bad person because you are over identifying with this, this like female character and not seeing her clearly. And a lot, a lot of the comments I've gotten about her so far, like we're obviously going to get to her in Battle of the Labyrinth too, which is Lord, um, is this whole like if I was lonely and alone in an island for a while, I also would do something like that. And I was like, well, I grew up really isolated, and I never was like, I want to sexually assault somebody. Yeah. Like, let's go do that because I'm upset. That's not how you think. Well, and even if you you can relate to that thought process in the past, you should recognize, hey, that wasn't cool of me, you know? Like, no. I'm glad that I've moved on from that thought process. Yeah, and like Calypso is just that person. Like, she manipulates anyone who comes near her, and that's the only way that she interacts with people is to try to manipulate them to get what she wants. And yeah. so you can understand that feeling of wanting to do that but it but her character goes so far that it's like if you're listening to this song and you're like she's a sympathetic figure in in epic the musical i'm like you're misrepresenting the like really hard work that went into making this song mm -hmm. and and like because i guarantee you that the creator did not want you to be like she's an innocent little baby bird victim yeah and like odysseus is a horrible man for not wanting to be with her for all these years <laughs> oh my gosh yeah and like yes the song is beautiful and the song has the words love it's not a romantic song like no. yeah <laughs> no he's like literally like they the we haven't watched it yet but we're going to after this but like okay. they have like animation and stuff that people make like that are somehow affiliated with the creator like he shows them like when he does like live streams when the new sagas come out and the animation i guess for my comments for that song was was odysseus just like packing up all of his stuff and just like walking away from her as fast as humanly possible the entire song she's yeah. trying to get him to like turn around and like pay attention to her and he's just like bye 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 and, like that's like no He's not he's not the bad one for wanting to finally escape his like kidnapper. Yeah, um, I just like and I want to say this in a way I hope this is not infantilizing at all. But like, I hate the way people argue with you because it feels like ableism. It mm -hmm. feels, and I know that like you can't see autism, you know, but like at the same time, that's where your passion comes from. It's why you can say these things and to certain people, you look deadpan. I don't think so, but like, you know, you seem so like aggressive. I hate that word. I hate it. Uh, but like, it's, it's resting autism face, you know? And like, um, I hate it because it's like, I want to shake them and be like, you are being an ableist fuck right now. Leave my friend alone. But like, I, I don't know. I it just sucks. And it sucks because like, if they would get past their uncomfortability with the way that you say things and the expression on your face or whatever, then they would probably be like, 
there's some truth to this, you know, and maybe I should re-examine how, what I'm thinking. I honestly think that's a big part of why people get so mad at me is because there's something in their brain that knows that what I'm saying is is like accurate or correct in some way. And they don't like that because they can't completely disregard it. And I, I'm going to try to figure out a way to say this, but I also think it's a thing of I know that I'm right about certain things and there's literally nothing that anyone especially a stranger on the internet that i have never met and i don't even know who they are Mm -hmm. i there's nothing that those people could say to me to get me to like give in and change my mind like i have like survived my entire life this is like the only thing that i have really that's positive from that experience is being very confident about what I do know when it comes to this sort of stuff about manipulation and abuse and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they like pull out every trick in the book. Like they try to shame me. Then they try to like be nice to me. And then they go back to just insult. Like they do every, every trick you can think of to try to get somebody to just like change their mind because you want them to agree with you. And I'm just like, no, I don't, I don't agree with you and I'm not going to change my mind. So You can keep talking to me, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change my mind. And that's basically what it turns into. And I think that's what gets people mad. And it's just like, you don't have to, I don't have to agree with you. I'm just a person on the internet. You can just move on with your life. And like, I do try to give people time to like, I don't want to block people right away because I do know (laughs) that we talk about is like, you know, emotionally charged subjects. Mm-hmm. And so I know that a lot of times people will react at first and then they'll like calm down and not be like that. But sometimes they don't calm down. Yeah. <laughs> but I do know that it's like a thing with me that people have like my entire life, they've always thought they thought that I think that I'm better than them. They thought that I am like angry when I'm not actually angry. I, I'm just like, passionate i just speak passionately and that comes across as like anger and aggression Mm -hmm. at this point it's like whatever i don't care (laughs) like i'm not like in a way of like i care when somebody like makes that many videos about me and is like like reading the words that i'm saying on the screen and like telling me that they say something else than they than they say that like that freaks me out but and i don't appreciate i don't like it when they do stuff like that but at the same time i'm like i'm not going to change how i communicate at this point because it's like the double-edged sword that the people that do like our videos and stuff because of me they like me because i'm like that yeah so like it's way more of like a positive reaction than a negative one like even the video that i did about luke like saying he's like the percy jackson version of a school shooter basically like there's a a couple people in there that was like that was like a wild first sentence but you're you're completely right yeah and so it's like yeah like if i'm sitting there i'm gonna sit there and explain to you why i feel like that i'm not being clickbait or like clickbaity or trying to like you know rage bait you or something i have a reason for why i'm saying what i do mm-hmm. and so most of the time people are like oh okay like even if they don't agree they'll just like move on because they can at least tell that I'm not an idiot (laughs) or I'm not being like, you know, mean on purpose. Like people can be on social media. So it's like, okay, there's a couple people every time this, like this happens that get like really enraged and I probably need to figure out a faster way to just block them or something. So it doesn't go on as long as it does. But most of the time it's a more positive experience overall, because I think people like, it when you're not bullshitting and honestly when it comes to like mythology it's like 97 percent neurodivergent people yeah like come on if you're not neurodivergent and queer and you like mythology why the fuck do you like it (laughs) no that's so true (laughs) yeah and um i mean like to hit on one other point this person made it they like said something about, oh, well, other adaptations where they have abusive or manipulative people and they they turn them into good figures. Oh, you're okay with that, but you're not okay with Calypso. 
No, we, we have it out for all of them. Um, <laughs> there is not a single manipulator or essayer or like anything like that, that we haven't called it out for what it is. Yeah, we are equal opportunity with that. It doesn't matter like what gender you are, who you are. We are the same with everybody. I think that's a good trait to have. But if we, if like our podcast was anything, that's like what it's known for is it doesn't matter who you are. If you're abusive, we're going to call you out the exact same way, no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. And it, that, so that post that she made about me, that was just really funny. It, the thing that was funny about it was she brought up Percy Jackson and she was like, oh, in Percy Jackson, there's versions of the gods that like rape people like Zeus and stuff but people are okay with them. And I'm like, name one person who is okay with the gods and Percy Jackson, who, even fans, who, who likes the gods in, the, in these books? Who even is a fan of them if you read these books? You hate them all. Yeah. A couple of them that people like sometimes, but even the gods that people like, like Hephaestus and Apollo and stuff, they also do things in other books that make you really mad at them. Mm -hmm. So there is like literally no God in the entirety of Rick Riordan's books out of all of them ever that like is nice to the gods. The entire point is not to be. Yeah. So I'm like, I know you're just talking bullshit. <laughs> if you say that, like there's probably other mythology adaptations that are nice to the gods mm -hmm. that are done by somebody else, um, but not this one. And so saying that, I, that's what like lost me for a while when they said that that was, they were like, oh, you're just being mean to Calypso because she's a woman. And I was like, can we not do Taylor Swift feminism right now? <laughs> like that, that, That's what that is. Like, no, people don't like Calypso because canonically in the myth, she ro roofied and then raped him for seven years. Yeah. And so this musical is not going to make a song where he gets roofied and raped. But like everything else that happens in the mist happens in this musical. Like he's saved the same way. He's there for as long. She won't leave him alone the way that she won't leave him alone in the myth. He's still like, he wants to kill himself because she won't let him leave. It's the exact same story. They're just not gonna show you something like that. Mm -hmm. But you can put it together and know that that likely was happening because everything else in the myth happened the same way. And yeah. either way, she's, holding him captive so like can we not like argue about how it's not that bad if he's not being like sexually assaulted the entire time she still like is being held captive and he can't go home yeah it's like a very weird experience i'm like i'm pretty sure they just don't like her because she's a horrible human being <laughs> yeah and we'll we'll talk more about her when we get into battle of the labyrinth <laughs> truly my my favorite thing of all time is how much the percy jackson phantom hates calypso <laughs> Everyone hates. Like, but you know how there's like things that, you know, people don't agree on. This is like one of the main things everyone agrees on. We all fucking hate her. Like, we're going to talk about another fan fiction. And the author of this fan fiction also wrote like a 5,000 word fan fiction that is just Annabeth yelling at Calypso for, for like 15 minutes. Yeah. Because it, we never got to see it in the Heroes of Olympus books when it desperately needed to happen because she's way worse in those books. And it, and like she that fan fiction has so many comments and likes and like bookmarks. It, like I made a I made like a TikTok about it like months ago and I still get comments on it every once in a while being like, I love this one. I go back and read it all the time because <laughs> people it was like wish fulfillment to see that finally happen because people hate her so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I just wanted to touch on that just because it was bullshit. <laughs> it's, yeah, we'll call out bullshit when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, yeah, we did plan for fan fiction today. And so this one had me in tears. Um, it definitely hit all of the things that, you know, like you feel as a mom in every stage. And so um, the one we read for today is called Awake, Awake, You Children Bold by um, mythology, but with an R instead of the first Y. So I don't know if that's mythology or Mr.ology, but <laughs> yeah. Um, and this, the idea of this fan fiction was Percy and Sally throughout the years. 
And um, it starts off chapter one. They warned us a storm is coming with, I'm guessing when Sally finds out she's pregnant, because like the first line is her saying something with putting a hand on a flat belly, a still flat belly, um, which, you know, means she's probably barely pregnant enough to find out from a test, but not pregnant enough to show. And um, we see her final conversation with Poseidon in this first chapter. Yeah, um, I so the author of this that I I love this author so much, like she wrote she's written fan fiction about Percy being sexually abused by Gabe, which is why I found her stories. And I literally like went just writ and read all of them. Like I read stories that I don't even like. <laughs> like I don't like like usually those sort of stories. Like she wrote a bunch of them about like Poseidon and his family. Mm -hmm. um and like percy interacting with them that's a whole thing and like percy jackson i don't give a fuck about poseidon and so i usually don't read any of those but i i was like i like this person so much that i feel obligated that i have to read them yeah. <laughs> but, um she does i really like how she shows um poseidon in this story that uh he's an asshole mm -hmm. and like he and he is and especially like if you would be Sally and Percy, especially Sally, mm -hmm. that is how you should, you would see him because he's like, he's sitting there like, oh, you're, you're like my queen and things like that. But it's like, you left me, like you knew that you would leave me when this happened and you dropped all of this on my feet and my child's feet knowing what you would put them through and you just did it anyway because you wanted to get what you wanted and then just like didn't care about the destruction especially because sally when she gets pregnant with percy is 19. yeah and like i forget like her backstory but it's something like a lot of her family recently died and she like got a ged like she didn't even graduate from high school like the quote-unquote normal way and then went to college and then and then dropped out of college because people in her family died and that's when she met Poseidon. So I'm like, she's like a super vulnerable, like going through a lot of emotional stuff, young 19 year old girl. And he's like, oh, I like this one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what did you like about her? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we see in this first chapter is Poseidon makes an offer to her that he can build her a castle and hide her away because everyone's going to be after her. And um, this this thought comes back throughout the rest of the chapters of this fan fiction of like, OK, what if I had taken him up on this offer? But um, Sally at 19 advocated for herself and was recognizing if she does that, she's not going to get to live her life. She's going to be in hiding. Um, I mean, if she's under the sea, I, would she even be able to leave on her own accord or anything like that? She'd probably just be stuck there. And there's not a lot of mythology on Amphitrite, who's Poseidon's wife, canonically. Like, would she be like a Hera figure and constantly have it out for her and Percy? Who knows, you know? Like, I don't have a good enough characterization from, of her from what I know. But um, I'm guessing it wouldn't be a good situa situation for him to build a separate palace for his second fami family down there. Yeah, and it's true that it would essentially be a situation where they would be held captive mm -hmm. in a weird way. Like, because if, if he was like, just stay in my palace, they would never be able to leave. Because if, if Percy knew that he was, you know, Poseidon's kid from the time that he was like, born and was growing up and stuff then people would monsters not only more specifically the other gods would know about him right away or like if they if Poseidon didn't want everyone to know about him mm -hmm. then they would literally like have to stay there and never leave and like even like hide if any of the other gods or other like powerful creatures or whatever came they would have to hide so that nobody would find out about them like that would be a horrible existence like things with percy's actual childhood was not great at all obviously but i'm not sure that like being hidden as like a big family secret 
until he got old enough where they couldn't hide him anymore. And then the entire rest of the world would find out that Poseidon was hiding this, like one of his sons in his castle in like his palace this entire time. Like mm-hmm. Zeus would just like electrocute every fish in the entire ocean and kill them all because he would be so mad about something like that. And so I can't really see a way that that could have happened where it actually would have been like a good idea. Yeah, and Sally in this fanfic even says it would be a cage. Um, And like, that's exactly it. She'd be confined there, never be able to leave. Um, And she refuses this knowing that this is pretty much gonna be the last time she ever sees him because she's refusing it. Yeah, so that was like, I'm gonna do this completely on my own for me. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, then we get a little time jump to right when Percy is born. And um, they're saying he's like about 10 minutes old. And um, there's this thing that they say instinctually happens with babies and you're not prepared for how it feels until it happens. So babies, they, they hear your voice when they're in the uterus the whole time. And so they know your voice when they come out. And I remember that moment where William was put on me and I said, hi, William, because like, you know, like what else do you say when your baby's born? And he just looked straight into my eyes. And so for Sally in that moment, um, it says he quieted and looked up at her with eyes that seemed to see too much. And that was like the moment that he was put on her. And it's, it's such a magical feeling. I get so sad sometimes thinking about how, because birth is very complicated. There are people that don't get to experience that, mm-hmm. but even though it's 100% instinct and like, you know, it's probably, they don't see it the same way you do. It just feels so magical in that moment. Yeah, that would be really magical. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. So uh, the other thing we kind of see is right away, he has very intense eyes that are kind of like Poseidon's. Um, and he's kind of not a normal baby. I mean, he still cries and stuff. They, they mention him crying, but he just, he seems to be a little bit easier for her, which like, I, I'm a little bit thankful for knowing that she was 19 and by herself completely. <laughs> yeah, thank God, because I don't know how I don't know how people do that, like, alone. Mm -hmm. Like, my sister had my niece a year last, not this past May, but the May before that. Mm -hmm. She has her partner, like, he's basically her husband at this point. They're just not married. But they were doing it all together. Like, he had, um, he had paternity leave he could take for, I forget, I think for, like, the first two out of like the first three months that she was on maternity leave, something like that. And so they were home when it was like this, I, what I imagined to be like the scary time where you're like having to figure out how to teach this like very new life, how to fall asleep and how to eat and, and take care of it in a way where it's also learning how to sleep and how to eat and how to just like exist as a person. Cause it's so new to being a person. Yeah. I can't imagine doing that kind of stuff like when you're 19 and you don't have a job that makes any money and you don't have maternity leave sometimes or your maternity leave sucks ass like some people have or you just don't have any like support like she didn't like Sally didn't even have like family because most of her family died not because she didn't have family but they just weren't alive anymore Mm -hmm. like help her and so like I just don't know how they how people who have to do that alone how they even do that like they have to so they make it happen but it would just be so hard yeah um i went from like i literally moved out of my mom's house like in labor you know because i i planned to not live with her anymore once william was born but we didn't really make a smooth transition it was like i went into labor still living with her and then um, this is my in-laws house, but they have since moved out and are living in what used to be a vacation home. And um, so it was them and it, me and Jake. And um, I had people 
my mother-in-law fed me like every single morning she would be like since I can't give him a bottle and you're breastfeeding, here's food, um, you know? And she'll be like, I can hold him so you can eat by yourself, so you can go shower and stuff. Um, Jake woke up with me every single night to change diapers. He was like, you know, I can't do anything else at night, so like, let me change a diaper. And I I would not have survived. I was like 100% taken care of. Um, and yeah, it seems, I don't even know. I don't even know. And especially like, how do you take time off work and still be able to afford everything you need for a baby? Like, yeah, yeah, that's the scary part for her. Um, but uh, we don't get too much of those details because then we get another time jump to toddler aged Percy. And what's interesting is that um, a monster is passing by, but Sally remarks, oh, he's still too little and not very strong, so this monster is just not even paying attention to him, which is great. And, you know, as a, um, as a toddler, he's just like, I want to go play. Can I go splash in that puddle? And so she has to, like, let go super early on, like, knowing, yeah, there's monsters out and about. They see him. They're passing him up now, but who knows how much longer they're going to pass him up. Mm -hmm. um, all while going through normal motherhood emotions, like, um, he still wants me to hold him, and how much longer am I going to even be able to carry him? Yeah, that is so, that's so much. Like, you're already afraid when you have a little kid like that in your life that they're somehow going to die, or, like, get hurt, or something bad is going to happen to them, because... Like mm -hmm. your entire like soul will explode if it, if something bad would happen to them, but like, it, but like with him, there actually are things after him. So it's not just like that like anxiety thought of of worrying about something bad going wrong. Like something bad is going to go wrong, yeah. <laughs> and it's it and it's just a matter of time. That's so complicated, especially because he's so little. Mm -hmm. then that he there's no way that he could ever know what's going on because he's way too young to even conceptualize something like that but it's like always it's like a I the way I picture it is like it's hard to enjoy like the good quote-unquote good times mm -hmm. like this before Gabe was around because that like like dread or like um of waiting for something to go wrong was always there yeah and that's just really hard to deal with how to handle something like that yeah and i mean thankfully sally is able to be like i don't know how much longer i'm gonna get these moments i'm gonna play with my son um that scene has percy splashing around in a puddle and she goes and joins him even though she's getting wet and dirty too mm -hmm. um which is just super sweet and it kind of goes to show that like it was always about creating as many good memories as possible for her i mean i know the gabe thing kind of is isn't in line with that but um as much as possible that's what she wanted to be was the soft place for him because she knew one day he was gonna have to go out into this world that has it out for him mm -hmm. Yeah, like, if, if, even if these things are going to happen to him and I can't control it, at least I can control how he feels around me and have that be something good in his life, no matter what else is going on. Yeah. Um, I believe he's still toddler aged in the next little kind of jump we get. Um, but one thing that I, like, wrote the exact quote down, he raged against perceived injustice in the world itself at times, which, like, the toddler stubbornness when they're like that, oh my gosh, because <laughs> toddlers 100% have a mind of their own. I mean, um, you know, people say terrible twos or three nager is another one that I've heard. Um, and when they're coming into their own and realizing, like, I can say no, or I can do things that aren't what I'm being told to do, um, they're forced to be reckoned with. So the fact that she was noticing for him, it was already about justice and injustice is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. That's very Percy-like. <laughs> yes. Um, so in this chapter, they note that Sally is trying to shield him from how much she's struggling 
but Percy somehow always knows. Um, so, you know, like little toddler Percy is offering her food when they don't exactly say it, but she's probably going hungry to make sure that he's fed because she's stressing. I'm always making sure he has enough, but then he offers me his food and won't take no for an answer. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's so sweet to think of little Percy like that, but also so sad at the same time. Yeah. That's one of those things that I over identify with because I was like that with my mom too. And it, my sister, but especially my mom, like growing up, I could always tell when something was wrong with her, even if she wasn't telling me. Mm. And it, when I was growing up, I would just sometimes ask her or just tell her, like, I know that something is wrong. Like stop, stop like acting like there isn't just because it would bother me. And she would say that to me, that she could tell when something was wrong, even if I didn't want to tell her what it was mm -hmm. and things like that. And it's just, it is really hard. Like I'm, sh I know for sure my mom wanted to hide a lot of that stuff, like from me, like worrying about money and not having enough money for food. Cause we never had enough money for food. Like mm -hmm. ever, <laughs> like, uh, there was maybe a few years when I was little, but most of life we never had enough money and um this is like aging me obviously but when i was young was in the 90s where like the internet was there but it was not at all like it was now mm -hmm. and so when we used to go to like the atm to like take out money because that's the thing that people used to do yes. before like online banking was as like nice as it is now and things like that but mm -hmm. Um, my mom sometimes on the weekend would go to take out money out of her out of their account and there would be like hardly any money left in it when she had gotten paid like the day before and she would have to call like the bank's like 1-800 number to find out like what charges were even there and it was my dad spending all of their money oh, and man. on stuff that does not matter like did not matter at all they didn't have like they didn't, we didn't have enough money for my mom to like buy food or pay their bills and my mom spending and my dad spending all of their money at like Menards buying rocks and bringing me to Menards and making me carry rocks around with him for some reason. And so like she would sometimes go home, come home on like Saturday mornings and I would see her like being upset and she would be trying to act like everything was fine. But I'm like, I can tell this is like your fake happy voice. Yeah. Like just stop acting like that. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, sometimes things are so bad, you can't really hide them from your kids. So like, William was four when I started going through all of my stomach problems. Mm -hmm. And not only was he like old enough to recognize like, oh, shit, there's something wrong. But um, there were times where it was just me and him in the house because it happened right after Jake started chiropractic college. And so Jake would leave at like 5 a.m. And then I'd be awake and in pain and like, I'd have to call my mom and my brother to help me out. Like my mom to go drop William off at daycare and my brother to drive me to the emergency room. Like that was the very, very beginning. And I still wonder to this day how much that stuff affects him because he's had nightmares before about losing me. And okay. it's just like, I feel terrible sometimes that I wasn't able to shield him from that, but like life is what it is. And um, I don't know, like I, I hope someday that wound of being afraid he's gonna lose me won't be there anymore. Yeah, that's, well, that's honestly one of those things that can be helped just purely with age because when he's older, he can talk about like remembering that stuff and now he has like context of what was going on when at the time you know he didn't because he was too young to understand fully like the gravity of what was really going on um but as he gets older that's something he can understand and it will be like at least the way i look at it is like it would probably be less scary once it becomes more clear what was really happening there and those things are like hard when your parents have like health problems like that but it also very much helps that you're not that you're not anywhere that sick anymore yeah 
Like you've yeah. become a lot healthier since I've known you. Yeah, and I mean, he's he's definitely my number one advocate when it comes for my allergies and stuff. Like he's always trying to figure out, is there a way we can make you cookies or things like that? And um, I saw once he popped Mark down on a paper where they were talking about genetically modified foods because he was like, he put a, an opinion in there of, I wonder if corn being genetically modified is why so many people have allergies to it. And I'm just like, oh, baby. That's so cute. Yeah, so I do see that there's like ways he's able to be like, yes, this is the situation, but it's partially controllable. And I'm also curious at how we fix it or how we work around it. Yeah, it's like a whole thing of no matter how, how hard a parent tries to like keep their kids safe, you can't ever keep them safe from everything mm -hmm. that would have that would upset them. You just kind of try to give them whatever you can to help them like cope with whatever is going on so it doesn't become like a bigger problem later on in life. That's all you can really do. Yeah. Um, so um, let's see. So Percy in this chapter, he's also mentions that he noticed a monster. And um, the way we know it's a monster is he says, oh, there was a mean guy and he only had one eye. and. Sally is, she feels like she's gaslighting him, but she just kind of responds in the way you respond to a toddler, which is like, oh, did he? And um, moves on from the conversation, tries to distract him with pizza. Um, but we find out that that is the night that she calls Gabe. And um, like, it's the start of their relationship in a way. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can see why, like, Percy noticing the monsters was a trigger for that. It's definitely like, oh, shit, what if these monsters are, like, that much closer to getting him? Um, but, yeah, we, we all know how Gabe and her end up. So, and in a way, it's like you understand it, but you're also horrified that that's the response. Like, that's the only way she can think to protect him. Yeah, and it, it feels to me like a thing of I need to feel like I'm in control of this situation somehow. Mm -hmm. And this is something that makes me feel like he's safer, even though he's not really safer. But it makes her feel like he is. And so she just like does it and just kind of ignores anything that ever comes up when Gabe is around that might make her think about how he's this isn't like the right decision. Yeah. And that's like and that's just what she can do because, and I can't even be like super, obviously I don't like it, but it's at, at the same time, I'm like, I get why she felt like she needed that. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it really sucks that her way of like dealing, feeling like she had some control was like, let me invite somebody really bad into our house and expose my kid to that because that's better than a, like a scary monster that feels like it should be in like a children's book and not like in reality. Yeah. Um, so that was the stop or the ending of chapter one. Chapter two is called Just Like Falling Snow. And um, it starts right away with Percy's like thought of, you know, his mom is his favorite person. Um, she's the person who sees all the effort that he puts in. Um, and so he tries to make her proud by like little kid brain doing what he's supposed to do, which is trying his best in school and eating his vegetables, things like that. Um, and let's see, it, he um, kind of says to himself in his brain, because we get a little bit of his perspective in this fan fiction throughout, um, he would be good, kind, just like his mama. Um, and in this chapter, we see also Percy start getting comments about not having a dad, um, which I don't know. Is I hope that that's not a thing that still happens. I feel like maybe it also is showing, you know, like that some of us that read this and also Rick Riordan's age. I know he didn't write this fan fiction, but like, I don't think it happens that way anymore. At least I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't happen as much. I honestly, I don't know, but 
I do know, I, like, it makes sense in my mind where those questions come from when they're not, like, kids, like, making fun of you, but more just, like, wondering because they, because little kids, like, they, on, they only know, like, their experience. And so if they have a mom and a dad and they go to school with somebody who doesn't, they're like, well, where's your dad or where's my, or where's your mom? Because it like opens up the idea that like something could happen to their mom or their dad. Like um, mm -hmm. my sister's partner's like brother has kids that are a little bit older. And one of them is like nine is 10 now. And the couple of times I've met her and Cassie has been there. She's asked us like where our dad is. Okay. And then we try to explain that he's dead without making her immediately start thinking about something happening to her dad. And so I feel like that's where some of those questions come from when it's just kids innocently asking mm -hmm. um, and not being like, you're stupid because you don't have a dad. Yeah. <laughs> But at least I think that's where it starts is like being like, oh, I love my dad and I love my mom. So why don't you have both of these people? Because little kids especially don't understand that sometimes you just you just don't. Mm -hmm. And and that because they just especially at that young age, they want everyone to get what you what they should. Yeah, but we do get a kid doing that in this chapter. And it seems to be fueled from his own parents' judgment of Sally. So um, in this chapter, there's a playground fight between Percy and a kid named Joey. And so Percy had ran out to the monkey bars as soon as they were let out to recess. And this kid, Joey, like tries to say, go away, kid, I want to play here. And so Percy says, you know, my mama says we're supposed to take turns, we're supposed to share. And Joey says, well, my mommy and daddy say I can play wherever I want. And since I have a daddy and you don't, that means my, my opinion matters more. And um, so, hold on, where's my dick spell? Um, Percy says, I don't need a daddy and my mama is the best. And then Joey responds by like something he definitely heard from his parents, which is my mommy says your mommy is a slut. <laughs> yeah. What? It's weird to think of this coming out of, I would have to imagine, preschool or kindergarten age children's mouths. Because, like, how are you saying that shit in front of your kids? People do. Yeah. I, it's just, it was, it was definitely jarring a little bit to read that part. And, um, so... Percy, in true Percy fashion, he, he wants to get him to stop, but he's like, at this point, you know, you insulted my mom, I don't really have control over what's happening anymore, and he pushes Joey. And that's when the next part is the teacher intervening, and Percy's just like, my mom is not going to be mad at me. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah. No. And so um, Percy does even tell the teacher what Joey said, and the teacher just like, <sighs> Okay, we'll call your mom, um, which I was a little disappointed in the teacher in that moment. I know that also, so the, the author of these fan fictions was trying to write each chapter in 1K words. So there's also brevity here, but like, that's all you're going to respond to that lady. Um, <laughs> so then the next scene we get is Sally actually picking him up and Percy explaining what happened in his own words. And like, you know, nobody's going to insult you to me. And Sally's like, you don't need to protect me, but also let's go get a treat, which is probably yeah. how I would react to that kind of situation. <laughs> yeah, like um, it makes me think of um, so there's an episode of Seventh Heaven where um, it's one of the ones where they try to shoehorn in like racism messages. And um, there is a black doppelganger uh, family of the Camdens. And so this one is the, the first one where you see the black doppelgangers. And um, in the episode, the, the youngest son, Simon, overhears a kid say the N-word to his doppelganger. And he punches him. And um, like the message that the Camdens eventually get to is like, yeah, that kid shouldn't have said that, but also don't punch him. I would have been like, punch him harder. <laughs> punch him. I was a little, I was talking about this 
with my sister yesterday. Um, Cause I don't know how we got on the, so oh, we were talking about how her partner um, is the youngest brother from his family and that the brother that's like two or three years older than him, I think, mm -hmm. um, when, he was once being bullied by somebody at school and then that brother showed up and, um, you know, beat up the kid a little bit and that person never bothered him ever again for the history of his life. And he was like, yeah, um, if you want to know like rage, like anytime anyone tried to do anything to Cassie, I would actually like threaten to kill them. And I like, and I was like, I never like talked then either. And so it like always shocked people when I was like that, but like the, <laughs> the story that we, Cassie like was like, are you thinking of that time on the bus? And I was like, that's one of the times, but like when we were, when she was in like seventh grade, I think, and we were, there was this kid, he was a really strange kid. He actually got caught a couple months after this doing something extremely bad to a girl who was disabled. Oof. So I have, I had zero guilt before this, but after that, I was like, I remember my mom coming to me and being like, I'm actually really glad that you did that to that kid. And I was like, yup, I like had no guilt before that moment, but I especially don't anymore. But he was, he was just sitting across from her on the bus and was like taking her like mechanical pencils out of her, out of her backpack and was like threatening to like break them in half. And I was like, we don't, and of course, my like overly parentified brain, I was like, my mom doesn't have any money to buy new ones. Okay. And I was also like, leave my sister alone. So I'm sitting in front of him. And I can't like stress how silent I was when I was at school, people would be surprised when I would talk mm -hmm. at all. And even when I talked, I would hardly make any noise at all. And then suddenly this kid is like taking my sister's pencils out of out of her backpack. I'm not even sure that he knew that she that she was my sister. And I turned around and grabbed his shirt. And I was like, if you touch my sister, any of my sister stuff again, I will kill you. And he immediately like dropped all of her stuff and was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And like Cassie got home and like ran into the house and was like, Mom, you have to hear about what Shannon did. It was so cool. And there was another story we that I was telling her about about when I lived with my a shitty roommate of mine that I told you about when I was like 21, 22 when I first moved out. Mm -hmm. um, and we had like pictures up on our wall and we had a picture of my of my sister up on our wall with like other friends and stuff. And I worked at a grocery store then and grocery stores are very similar to restaurants with how ridiculous the employees are and how like almost incestuous it is by how everyone is dating and everyone's going out and getting really drunk and things like that. Mm. And I didn't really do much of that, obviously, but everyone else was always doing it. And so my roommate was friends with a lot of those people. And one of those guys, um, one of those guys was on the phone with her and was talking about seeing a picture of my sister and thinking that she was hot. And the thing that he said was, oh, I can you invite her over for the next party? Because I want to be around when she gets drunk. And I took the phone from her and was like, what did you what the fuck did you just say about my sister? And he was like, what? 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 what did, I'm just joking. What is the joke? I remember being like, what is so funny about you wanting to get my sister drunk so you can take advantage of her? I didn't say that. Well, why else would you say that, sir? Yeah. And I like he the next time he came over, I just looked at him and I was like, if you say anything about my sister ever again, I will beat you up. Okay. And I was not exaggerating. I was ready to walk back to pick and save and beat him with anything that I could find. Like, do not talk about my sister. I will kill you. <laughs> and and I get like that way about I used to get that way about my mom, too, with my dad, where he would start going off on her. And the times when I would absolutely lose my mind on him, where I would just start screaming and crying at him for like five minutes in a row, like on like no pausing, and then hang up and not talk to him for an entire week was when he was calling my mom like a slut and and things like that, because she dated like two people in like the 10 year span after they got divorced. And he would call her things like that or say that she was like trying to do all these things that she wasn't doing 
and I would just lose my mind on him and he would be like, I'm sorry. And I would just not speak to him for over a week until I finally would just give in because he was so annoying trying to talk to me that I would just talk to him so he would shut up. Yeah. But like that stuff, like that sort of rage, especially when you're like the a, a only child like Percy or an older kid like me, it's like, don't do that. Like you don't know what rage is actually like until you mess with like an older sibling or just an only sibling when they only have one good parent. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah and i mean sally does tell him like oh we should try to be nice to people even if they're not nice and percy's like thinking to himself yeah no fuck that like i'm not gonna be nice to people who are being mean to you um and so um that brings us to chapter three which is called i love you don't you know um and this jumps ahead to when gabe is now living with them and um, so Sally is looking in the fridge at a fridge full of beer and there's beer all in the recycling cans. And then she overhears Percy coughing. And this is definitely like a mom thing. Anytime you hear your child while they're sick, the amount of worry that goes through your body, you know, like every single cough, every sneeze, every sniffle becomes painful. And um, so, you know, Gabe's over here like, wanting his beer saying get me my beer woman where are you and she's just worried about like i don't have money to take percy to the hospital that cough really doesn't sound good i don't know what to do because she says in this chapter she's already taken him to see her neighbor who's a retired nurse which is what she can afford because that's free um and meanwhile like she doesn't even know if any of the medicine that she's giving him is making a dent because he's a demigod and like, does that even work the same? Um, you know, she's given no instruction manual like all of us other parents, but there's the added divine blood and DNA in him that makes it so much more complicated. Or wait, I forget, dem demigods don't have DNA, right? I don't know. I don't know any of that stuff about, about like Percy Jackson especially. Besides that Rick titled a, a, a blog that said, no, they're not all related. <laughs> that's that's uh, <laughs> that's one of the first like blogs he ever posted after the book came out in like 2005. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I don't I don't know any of that. I just don't care about stuff like that. When I when I generally like enjoy a story, I just don't care about little details like that. I know that some people love to like fixate on that stuff. I just that's just not my neurodivergent brain that that's not what I do. Um, but I at least know that it is true that it's like you, I remember when I was little or little when I was like 12 or something, I, when I was a teenager, 11, 12, for a long time, I used to get really, really bad, like cramps when I get my period, like really, really bad, mm -hmm. like to the point where I wouldn't be able to walk. And if I didn't take like a ton of ibuprofen, I would be like, puking in the bathroom at school and things like that every single month. Um, it was like that for the longest time. And I remember when I was like 12 and that first started, um, my mom would like come in like the room when I would be like in abject pain. And she would say like, like, I wish I could like take this from you. And, and it would happen to me instead. And I remember at the time being like telling her even like, you're not telling the truth. Because me at the time, I was like, this hurts so bad. Why would you ever want to feel something like this? But me now, like, even, especially now, I definitely understand what she meant. Like, I would rather, um, I have a, a different friend online that also has a niece around the same age as my niece. And we, our, like, messages are literally just sending pictures of our nieces back and forth and talking about how great our nieces are. And the other day, she was like, do you ever just like panic thinking about something bad happening to them? And I was like, yeah, I like nothing bad can ever happen to her because my life would end <laughs> if anything bad ever happened to her. And so now, like if my niece was sick like that, which there, she could likely have like asthma and stuff because a lot of people in our family do. If she gets sick, like I used to get sick a lot with respiratory stuff when I was a kid. If that same sort of thing happens with her, it's going to be so hard to watch. And I absolutely would rather have those problems all over again than to have to watch her do it. 
Yeah. Even It's just funny to remember 12 year old me being like, this sucks so bad. Why would you want this to happen to you? And now, and now I'm like, oh, never mind. <laughs> That's yeah. what a parent is like. Yeah, exactly. And um, we do get a little insight to um, her and Gabe. Um, I mean, it says, she didn't regret marrying Gabe. She'd already seen several monsters pass Percy by since the disgusting man had moved in, but she thought she might hate him. So, um, yeah, and and hate is such a strong word there too for somebody that you actually went through with marrying. Like, yeah, I mean, we all we, we knew she didn't love him, but hate is like totally different too. Yeah, what one thing that this this author is definitely somebody who went through a lot of some sort of abuse when they were a kid because you can tell mm -hmm. the stories that are written and that are like accurate with this stuff because you can tell the ones that aren't because they're very over dramatic and weird. It's like sometimes it's just little details you can just tell because it's just the stuff that you know when you've experienced it before. Mm -hmm. And one thing I really like about this story is that it shows that you can be a good person and end up making a couple decisions where you end up doing stuff that you think that you would never be capable of doing mm -hmm. and you just end up doing it like sally in this story is like i need to protect my kid and i feel like being around this guy is the best way for me to to protect him yeah. and as the story goes along you see how you see how like how much that affects Percy and then affects her and how she doesn't notice when things are going on with Percy that she should have noticed because you just when people are I this is like a big thing that I always talk about but I think people have to believe for their own sanity's sake which I wish they would get over it because it's annoying when you're somebody who went through that before but I think a lot of times people imagine that the people who end up in situations like that are like the worst people you can ever imagine that they're just really bad people mm -hmm. that they're the only people that could make those sort of decisions and end up in a situation like that because I would never do that like that stupid family that went viral the last couple of weeks I can't even count how many posts I scrolled by of people just virtue signaling and being like I would never do that to my kid I would never act this way with my kid. I don't believe you. You're talking nonsense because you do. People end up doing things like this and they're not doing it because they're meaning to hurt you or hurt their kids or harm them in any way. But it just it happens a lot faster than people realize. Like people want to protect their kids. If they think that they are protecting their kids, even if they're wrong, they're going to end up in a situation like that and then not see the signs of that things are wrong like sally doesn't notice them in this story when it comes to percy because they because she just doesn't want to imagine that she's somebody who could do that to her kid mm -hmm. and so at, at some point in this story percy has to like literally tells her but like she until that moment she doesn't want to believe that, that she could trap her son in that situation so she just tells herself it's not happening and yeah. that's genuinely how it happens it doesn't mean that you don't get to be angry at them and then you don't have to hold them responsible and talk about about how that happened. But they're not monsters. Mm -hmm. They're normal people. The other person hurting the child is the monster. But yeah. usually the other person there is not like a monstrous being. And I think that people imagine them to be because they don't want to imagine that they're capable of that. And like, sorry to say, but every single person is capable of that if you're in a vulnerable enough situation and you don't have other people to help you get out yeah like end of story <laughs> yeah and i mean going along with what you said um the the story even says at this part she thought gabe was ignoring percy um and she's already dreaming of like well i'll just leave him once percy's old enough to go to camp or once percy knows the truth and um i don't know like this is definitely spoiling something that happens later in the fanfic, but um, we find out that Gabe likes to put his cigars out on Percy mm -hmm. and that at one point Percy got a really bad infection. And it makes me wonder if this is that point because he is really sick. They don't know what's going on. And like, um, 
Like, what What if that was the reason why... Meanwhile, she's thinking, oh, well, Gabe doesn't pay attention to him. It's all on me. And we kind of see that back and forth, too, of them both being like, well, if it's happening to me, then it's not happening to them. Um, which is, this is Sally's turn in that kind of mindset. Yeah, and that stuff, that sort of thing happens a lot when there's abuse like that happening at home. Like, I'm trying to think of an example I could say, but with myself but that kind of stuff happened with me where i can think of so many times that i was like sick or something or thought that i was sick but it was like like actually something else that was going on mm -hmm. and i just like didn't didn't say anything because i didn't want anyone to know or didn't think that i could tell someone even i guess like a safe thing would be like when i was uh especially like nine or ten i can remember that i didn't there were like certain foods that i don't like eating and i just didn't like eating in front of my dad because he would look at me and like literally laugh at me um with it without going like further into why it doesn't matter but he would just do that and my mom would would ask me like why aren't you swallowing your food or like why aren't you eating your food or like, why don't, why do you not want to eat like around everybody? Like I would go into like the kitchen in the middle of the night and like eat when I couldn't sleep and things like that. And she would see that like I was eating, but not when everybody else was eating. And I would just like not say anything because I didn't know how to like explain that stuff. And it's, and there's a lot of times where th things were like really wrong with me. Like I would be in like a lot of pain. Like I can remember times when I was like 12 or 13 where I would be like puking when I would be at home by myself and I wouldn't tell her about it. And then she would come home from one of her jobs and like find me sick like that. And I would be like apologizing to her for being sick because she would have to like go like, like clean up the bathroom and stuff. And that was like the way that I thought about it was I don't want to make something more for her. But <laughs> that's just like your instinct, especially when you're a kid in that situation is you want to like, per you feel you want to protect like the parent that is really nice to you from from finding out about like this really bad stuff that's happening because you don't want to make them sad like yeah. to be, like incredibly like simplistic about it like you know that it's going to make them sad and so you don't want to tell them because you don't want to be the reason why there's even though you're not the reason why they're sad that's the way you see it when you're a little kid and so you just don't want to do that to them so you try to put it off as long as humanly possible yeah um so sally gives um gave his beer and then she goes to percy and um i'm guessing at this point he's probably elementary school age because it says that <clears throat> he was already switching to calling her mom instead of mama but like we have sick little percy going mama please stay with me and um, he asks her, like, you know, stay with me in my room, like, sleep here with me tonight. Um, and so Sally, she does stay with him as he's falling asleep. And as she's looking at him, she's noticing, you know, the baby features are starting to go away. It's definitely, like, sad and painful as that starts happening. You're like, oh, they, they have, like, a big boy face now. Um, with William, it always happened with haircuts where I would notice it more and be like, oh, he looks so much older. <laughs> um, and, um, she also notices that as his baby face is fading, his features that make him look more like Poseidon are kind of popping. And, um, yeah, we have that bit about like, does medicine even work for demigods? And she just chooses in that moment to soak him in again to like cuddle and you know like i don't know how long i'm going to be able to hold him like this i'm going to be able to be with him like this or he's going to want me around like this so um yeah that's where we end the chapter is her just cuddling him and being like i love you so much <laughs> very sweet mm -hmm. Um, chapter four is called It'll Soak You to the Bone, and this is where it gets into Gabe's abuse. So um, Percy is packing to probably go to one of the many private schools he goes to or boarding schools. Um, and Gabe is lighting a cigar and Percy's like flinching already, kind of knowing what's ha happening. Gabe's like, get out of here, you stupid kid, but then grabs him and like kind of draws him in as like, 
I don't know. It, it didn't make sense to me because it was like the simultaneous like get away, but like I'm going to pull you closer so that I can put this out on you. And um, what ends up happening is he puts the cigar out on Percy's forearm. Yeah. And I mean, this is a type of abuse that Rick Ryder didn't get didn't get into, but does make sense for Gabe's character and what we know of him. Um, I mean, in some respects, Gabe reminds me of Mr. Kakashka from like Hey Arnold. Um, but like, of course, way worse because Mr. Kakasha was portrayed as like a bumbling idiot, but like he he thinks that he's charming and funny. But Gabe is like the worst version of that, where it's like he doesn't work. He's sitting around playing poker, smoking, um, smoking cigars, like drinking beers and just being a nothing. Um, meanwhile, like he's torturing this poor kid. I don't know. Yeah. Well, abusive people like that are like so weird because they're children. Mm -hmm. Like emotionally, like they have like like Gabe is at the same emotional level as Percy most of the time. Yeah. Like even in the TV show, they have him be impressed by the fact that Percy says that he beat a tactic kid at school because that's like where Gabe is when it comes to like maturity is he's impressed by that idea. But um, when it comes to like stuff like this, they're like the most pathetic people because he has to like hurt an innocent little kid who's trapped with him, who can't go anywhere or do anything without him because he's a kid mm -hmm. in order to make himself feel better about himself. And it's like, do you know how pathetic of a human being you have to be where the only way you can feel the way you feel good about yourself is by hurting an innocent child that can't escape you because it's illegal for them to leave and go somewhere where you're not there. Yeah, that's like, they're the most pathetic people ever. But the whole thing of like, go away, and then he grabs him is, yeah, <laughs> they never make any sense. They like tell you to like go away or I'm done talk like my dad's thing was like I'm done talking to you and then blah, 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 and then he would start like ranting again. Yeah. And it was like you don't actually listen necessarily to what they're saying because they don't actually make they don't ever make sense. And so yeah. it's like, like that's one of the things that's very disorienting about it is that you can't guess what they're going to do. You have to like watch their body language. Um, more than anything to figure out what they're actually going to do because what they're saying out loud is not accurate to what they're actually thinking about or trying to do to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I mean, we don't see anything that happens before this. Um, I mean, we can imagine Percy was just packing and just getting ready to leave for school. But it was like, why did he have to get that one last shot in before Percy left? Like, he's because, gonna be gone. Because Percy was happy. Like, yeah. because Percy was happy. Percy was leaving. Like, if Percy leaves, then, then Gabe can't use him as a punching bag to make himself feel better about himself. Yeah. And so he's, like, trying to make Percy feel really bad right before he leaves so that he doesn't feel good the way that he thinks he doesn't feel good. Like, I hate how I know stuff like that, but that's just like why they do those things. You absolutely don't know that. Like when it's actively happening to you, the only way you can handle it is thinking like, I should have done something differently. I did, I said something wrong. I did something wrong. It's not until like years later where you can look back at it and realize that it had nothing to do with you, that they were just upset about something else and they were taking it out on you. Um, mm -hmm. but that is like why they actually do stuff like that. It's never because you actually did something wrong. They're just an asshole. <laughs> and that's the only way they know how to cope is to, to make a smaller person feel bad. Yeah. And I mean, Percy even does a little bit of to himself in this chapter of like, well, why am I talking back to him? Like, yeah. maybe that's why he grabbed me and stuff. And it, it's just, it is hard to read. Um, especially knowing he's got to be less than 11 here because we're not even at the lightning thief yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the next scene we get is Percy goes to the, the store for supplies because he's worried about an infection. He's already had an infection from one of these cigar burns at this point. 
and um, he kind of is a little bit aware of his water powers a little bit here because he says like oh the infection almost washed away in the shower and I'm not sure how it worked but for some reason it worked but just in case it doesn't work I need to get supplies and so he's going through a store he's picking up band-aids he's picking up ointment um, he picks up candy because he's like, I need to be inconspicuous. Somebody's going to think, why is a kid buying this stuff? Mm-hmm. And then he also picks up gauze and he puts that in his pocket because he knows he's not going to be able to afford anything. He's like, he basically already was like, why are band-aids so expensive? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And then he pocketed the gauze knowing like, I probably only have enough money for these things. But even then... He goes up to the counter and the cashier says, you're 78 cents short. And so Percy's like, well, I don't need the candy, I guess. Um, And the cashier kind of questions him at this point. She's like, what do you need with all of this stuff? And um, Percy, he even like remarks in his own head, I've learned at this point that if I don't look adults in the eyes, they're going to think I'm automatically lying. I need to look at her as I'm saying this. And so he says that his mom sent him for the supplies, which like, you know, that as as an adult would cause another question for me of like, okay, if your mom sent you, then why didn't she give you enough money for these? But um, the cashier then just calls him out on, um, well, what about that gauze in your pocket? Because she saw him like put it in his pocket. And Percy doesn't really say anything at this point. Um, I think he's scared because he realizes he's caught, but she ends up letting it pass and she's like, you know, just take the gauze, take the candy, um, get out of here before we both get into trouble. Yeah, I'll, like this story reminded me of like so many different things from my childhood. Like, um, I remember, I think, I think I was like six or seven. And I remember we, my mom used to go to like this racquetball club Mm -hmm. i don't know what that is it's like just like a gym but in an area with rich white people (laughs) because that's like where we live we were never rich but a lot of other people were where a racquetball club would exist my mom used to go there and do like swimming lessons and stuff and she would like have me and my sister go to like their little like daycare whatever area when she would be doing swimming laps and I remember one time we were there and we were outside on like their playground and the, the like the teacher, whatever person was like, oh, don't stand on this thing because you'll get hurt. And I was like, I'll be fine. And then of course, immediately I got hurt <laughs> where I, I like fell and like, just like got like a cut on like my, on like my leg somewhere. And, but like, I was like six or seven. And like my response to that already by that point was that, I hid it from the teacher, my sister, and all the other kids, and I, like, went inside, found Band-Aids on my own from, like, the first aid thing, and went in the bathroom and cleaned myself up and, like, and, like, got put Band-Aids all over, like, the cuts and stuff, and was, like, paranoid the rest of the day about somebody, like, catching me that I did that because I thought that I was going to get in trouble because they told me that I wasn't supposed to do that, and then I got hurt on it anyway. And was like worried that my mom would see it and then get like scared that I got hurt or something like that. And it, so that's just like the response you have, like, especially when you're aware that your parent doesn't have money, which is something that happened a lot to me when I was older, is that you're like, I can't go to the doctor because the doctor also might notice that something is wrong because they're supposed to ask questions, even though a lot of them don't, but still there's, they're supposed to. And so you don't want to go to the doctor because your parent can't afford it. And then you also don't want to go to the doctor because they might like ask you too many things and Mm -hmm. you're worried about them somehow figuring something out. And then what would happen after that? And so you just like try to figure it out on your own. Like I remember when I was like 10 or 11 around that age, I used to go to this one bookstore in our hometown all the time. And the lady there would just let me be there for like hours. And I would just like read Goosebumps books and for free. Mm-hmm. And I would just I would read the entire book when I was there. And like me and my sister would just like show up there, especially when my parents got divorced. We would just be there for like hours. And it was a tiny little bookstore. It was like one room 
and it was like walking into like a tiny little like shop or whatever and so it's not like we were like hiding in a corner somewhere where they didn't notice like the lady who owned the bookstore was really nice to us and like somewhat knew my mom because she worked at the grocery store in our hometown mm-hmm. and so she just like let us be there and it would just like let us be there for as long as we wanted to be there before we would have to go back home and we would just go places like that until my mom was home from her second job so that we didn't have to be home by ourselves with my dad yeah. when I was like 10 and when she was like 10 and I was like 12. Um, like Matilda. Yeah. Yeah. It's very similar. To, we used to go to the library all the time. I freaking love the library because of that. Like the library is like a perfect place for abused kids because you can go there forever, like use their computer. You can like read magazines, read books, and nobody's there to like tell you that you're not allowed to look to like read that stuff and you can read an entire book if you're me anyway <laughs> and you read really fast you can read basically an entire book in one day and not have to like bring it home where they would like ask questions about what you're doing and things like that um yeah. that's what i love libraries just for that re- and it's also very quiet so that's always a plus but yeah that reminded me of that so much of um like when the cashier was asking him questions i was like shut up like if you ask him enough questions he's not going to come back yeah. he, and he needs like to do something and this is like the best that he can do so i was glad that she just like let him like take stuff and and that was it like my mom at our like grocery store job my sister and i used to, sometimes we'll just look at each other and be like remember when we used to shoplift every day <laughs> because there's like a there was like a bulk candy aisle that had like sour gumballs and we would go there when my mom was working when they were getting divorced and he was like especially crazy during that time and we would sit in like the magazine aisle which is where the sour were the sour candy like bulk things were and we would read like all the teen magazines and just eat sour gumballs out of like the bulk bin and like people who worked there would see us doing it <laughs> and they never said anything and we just like used to go there every weekend and just shoplift candy (laughs) and like read their magazines and everyone just like let us do it because it was a you know it's a small town everyone knew like everyone who worked there knew my mom and they knew like vaguely the situation that was going on um because it's not like my dad never showed up there and screamed at her about something yeah and so like they knew what was happening they just like let us do it but it was just those little memories we remember about like those were really nice people that they just kind of like hand waved and like let us do that and didn't and didn't cause like a problem about it when we were definitely stealing from them. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, like and the library thing, too, I think that's what Jake's grandpa did. Like that was the one story he told of why he likes reading is because he'd hide out from his dad at the library all day. Um, mm-hmm. And the librarian knew him by name and would would talk to him all the time or like she would try to parent him a little bit from the sounds of it, but um, he spoke of it with nothing but affection. So, yeah, it's like nice affection of like, oh, you like notice that I'm a person and you like me and and want to try to help me out sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I I was especially obsessed with Matilda. Mm -hmm. I watched that movie at least a few times a lot of times especially later on but i read the book a bunch of times too yeah yeah um so we close out the chapter and i think this is where the title of it comes from when percy walks out it is raining and it says that rain is um a measure of peace he he usually only felt around his mom when gabe was out and um i it makes me think to that scene in was it the first episode where we see Sally sitting out in the rain, just letting herself get soaked? Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, I mean, Poseidon's also kind of associated with storms and stuff. So you have to imagine that that's part of the whole power and mystique of being a Poseidon kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love water. Then we get into chapter five, which is um, called The Thunder in Your Lungs. And this is basically at the point of the lightning thief. Um, So Sally is about to take him to Montauk. She knows that these are going to be the last moments where Percy is completely innocent in her eyes, meaning 
innocent in that he doesn't know about the mythological realm. And um, so she um, she notices like his face looks more and more like Poseidon's, which is something she keeps saying as he's growing. Um, and they head off to the cabin, they clean together, they um, roast some marshmallows, and she um, she notices Percy likes to roast his marshmallows, but then he gets like distracted and then they end up catching on fire anyway. And, but he's too stubborn to let her do it for him when she asks. So um, th- something about that just feels very classic 11 year old. <laughs> Yeah, and then it skips ahead to the Minotaur part, um, which, you know, like, Grover is already with them. It's it's casually mentioned that Grover's here, but not really, because Sally's not focused on Grover that much. Um, Sally knows that once this Minotaur is in their sights, there's no way that she's going to survive. So she loads Percy and, and Grover into the car, taking a moment of joy to realize that the car is probably not going to survive and it's Gabe's car and it's pride and joy. And then she, um, she noticed, or she thinks that if I could just get them to the border because I trust Grover to get him past, you know, like once they get to the border. Um, and we kind of get some of her thought process too, as she's in the Minotaur's clutches. So, um, the Minotaur is already grabbing her. She's like clawing at its hand and stuff. She knows she's going to die. She knows that there's it's futile. But um, then she hears Percy scream her name in the background. And the way that she describes it in her thoughts is that it's, it's the most beautiful sound as if like the same cry from when he was first born because she knows that he's alive behind her. Like she knows that he's somewhere alive and so she just tries to focus him as this minotaur is taking her out and um the last thing that she says to him is go she knows that he heard it but um you know it says she um then nothing just the remnants of percy screams in her ears and what like really hits is the line in this part of that she would die a thousand deaths if it meant that Percy got to live once, um, like while she is literally dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we do know that she gets saved, but in this moment, she doesn't know she's going to be saved. She just and um, yeah, the the poof into nothingness with like, that's the last thing she heard is at least she knows he's alive. I don't think she ever could have predicted that he would take on the Minotaur himself after that. <laughs> no. When I was reading this, I was thinking about how mad, how pissed she would have been if she knew that um, that Percy ran away from Grover <laughs> and fought the Minotaur because he was so mad that the Minotaur killed his mom. Mm-hmm. It's like, dude, like I trusted you with one thing. Yeah. And he didn't do it, especially because, like, in the TV show, at least, Grover, when he wakes up, is like, maybe I should have told you about all of this sooner, and maybe then your mom would still be alive. And it was like, shut up. Mm-hmm. Stop stop saying things like that if you don't want him to just, like, punch you in the head or something um, and to, like, bring up his mom. But, yeah, that is, like, exactly what parenting is like, I think, when you're not a horrible person. <laughs> is that you do like anything so that your kid will be okay yeah and um it's sad because she's thinking this whole time while this is happening percy's never gonna recover from this but he'll be okay he'll, like he's gonna survive it's just like i mean i have been depressed enough that i've had ideations before in my life but once I became a mom, that really was a point where it was like, I couldn't do that to that kid, you know, like, and I do know that depression, you can't really control it in that way that like, you know, sometimes it does get that bad that you start thinking even your kid would be better off without you. Mm-hmm. But um, there is a part of me that knows like, this kid is going to be so destroyed when that happens. Like, and I mean, even just the mention that I am a mortal being sometimes he'll be like don't talk about this like let's stop talking now (laughs) yeah it is really hard especially when you're a kid as young as like William is to know that 
that's just something that is going to happen one day no matter what you do mm-hmm. it's like no matter when this happens it's going to be absolutely horrendous so my way of dealing with that is like i just don't think about it very much like other people dying i guess mm-hmm. i just know that it's going to happen one day and if it when it does like it's gonna really suck and i hope that it's not something like really prolonged and things like that for anyone that's horrible when it's like a really prolonged sort of death but other than that that's all i can really do about it i know some people really think about it a lot but i'm not afraid of death um in that way so i'm not afraid of like what would happen to them after they die or anything like that and it is weird in this sort of world too where you know like actually know where the where like this person is going to end up Mm -hmm. they're going to end up in some level of the underworld and you could conceivably go and see them again when they're down there if you could figure out where they are yeah and when most people can't do that yeah well i mean percy doesn't really know this yet either that's the thing uh, it's also just a thing of like her knowing like this is really gonna this is gonna be really bad but i don't know what else to do yeah and like realizing this is probably just giving him more time to run anyway yeah yeah um so then we get to chapter six which is after the lightning thief um and it's percy looking at the statue of gabe in the gallery that he got sold to It says that Percy occasionally visits the statue. So, like, he actively goes and visits it. Um, While he's visiting it, he's, like, wondering what happened to Gabe. He wonders, did he truly die? If he did truly die, I know that man didn't have any change for Carol and to ferry him across. Um, So he would be in the unburied section of the underworld, which means, like, you don't even get to cross the ferry at all. Um, And he it says that he liked the idea better that gabe is still in that statue and gabe is trapped and gabe has to see that he's okay because that's the only way he could feel like he won (laughs) i'm like laughing because i know exactly what that's like well i mean i it's it's weird to put it this way but that that's kind of what happened to your dad when you really think about it like because he became nonverbal, not able to do anything by himself as close to a statue as you can get yeah and also it's also just something that i think about even now like you're dead like you tried so hard to kill me you little bitch and but you didn't for some reason or you just and you couldn't get me to be so sad that i took myself out like i almost took myself out but i didn't I somehow didn't and I'm still here despite everything that you did to me and so I literally like sometimes will just like go on a walk and like listen to songs and just like imagine him like seeing me still alive and just being like fuck you bitch (laughs) and like you like you thought you were gonna like end me and you almost did but I'm somehow like still here and I like tell people all the time about all the stupid things you did and like everyone like by everyone i mean like his like his siblings and his his family and stuff knows way more about the stuff that he was doing before he got away with all of that stuff when he was alive and so it just feels really great to know that all of that is out there and they all know about it and then they all like me mm-hmm. and they like don't like him at all and i just sometimes i just th- do that sort of thing where i just think about him And I'm like, how mad does it make you that I'm like trying to make a living one day based on like the things that I learned because of what you put me through and that I didn't and that you didn't like break me enough to make me afraid to like tell people about it. And it just makes me feel really happy that after everything that he did, that he couldn't, he tried so hard to like ruin everybody. And he almost ruined everybody's relationship. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Even like, like me and my moms or like me and my sisters, but even if those relationships aren't, aren't maybe what I would like, you would want them to be in like a fantasy land where everything is great. 
it's like they're the best they could they have ever been ever and it i like i know for a fact that he never thought that this was even possible mm-hmm. and so it feels so good to like um have that like success of knowing like you didn't actually beat me you little bitch <laughs> like i actually ended up beating you like you you tried so hard but it didn't but it didn't work i'm like still alive and living my life and and like figuring out how to actually be happy when you are never happy a single day in your life like not even once <laughs> were you ever actually happy for the entirety of your life and that is like sad but i also think that you deserve to never be happy <laughs> yeah and so i don't really care that you never were but it's that sort of feeling of feeling like you finally like beat them um i love i love those like moments where i think about that like when i when i see pictures come up when i was super suicidal i just think about how glad i am that i never actually tried or never actually did it like five years ago because my life would be so much more tragic if i had it would have just been really sad but now it can be a lot better and in the same way with percy like he got to be free of gabe and now he gets to go on and live his life and you know be happy and watch his mom be happy and gabe is just stuck in the underworld um probably getting tortured in the fields of punishment if he ever gets in there or especially like he like gabe out of everyone should absolutely be terrified of poseidon Mm -hmm. (laughs) like (laughs) like like poseidon finding out about the stuff that Gabe did to his like prized son who he shows up and literally says, you're my favorite child. Yeah. Like, oh my, he would like rip like the blood out of his body or, or something or just crazy. <laughs> Cause Poseidon already has that rage inside of him. That's the whole like emotions of water and stuff like that. So there would be like no limit to what he could do to him after he was already dead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see, um, so what, um, Percy thinks to himself here is, um, he could deal with almost anything except for his mom hurting, and he's kind of mad at himself a little bit while he's looking at this Gabe statue, because he realizes that Gabe was lying every time he's like, oh, well, I, you know, like, I'll hurt your mom if you tell her, thinking that like Gabe wasn't already hurting her. And um, so Percy kind of decides in that moment, he has to tell her. And um, he does tell her a little bit, like he doesn't tell her everything in that moment, but he tells her that Gabe was hurting him and um, shows him like one, shows her one of the cigarette burns and that kind of stuff. And, I mean, I hear you doing it with your own mom of like, I'll tell her some things, but I don't think I can tell her everything right now. And um, like still being protective while like realizing this is, this is probably good for both of our relationship. But yeah, it's just, it's kind of hard because like I could say as a mom, I, I would want to know but I'd also be really hurt at the same time. So like, I get what you would be protecting her from, but it's, it's hard, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is really hard. And when you're in that sort of position, the way I look at that stuff is like, I don't, I don't have this need anymore to like tell my family members, like the like horrible details of how things transpired because it doesn't actually do anything. Like, I don't want to like, I'm not vindictive necessarily in that way. I don't want to get, I don't want to make them sad. I don't want to like, I'm not resentful in that way where I want them to feel bad. Mm -hmm. There definitely were times where I felt like that and I didn't, that's why I didn't talk to any of them for those years because I did feel like that. Um, But I don't feel like that anymore. And so it's like a thing of like, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible t- talking to somebody that you love and telling them something and knowing that it's going to make them really upset and really sad and look at like themselves and you and this other person they knew differently. Like you don't like doing that. And so it's like, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to, it's going to be for a reason that 
I feel like is something good for them to know, not just to know it. Like sometimes when you start going to therapy stuff, you feel like everyone needs to know every single thing that ever happened. But it's like they don't actually need to know because they know enough to know how bad it was. And one thing that does happen with me and my mom right now that is <laughs> interesting is that we just like talk about stuff and we accidentally like um, say things to each other without knowing that we are that like makes the other one react because I don't know what she doesn't what she didn't know and she doesn't know what I didn't know that like that sort of thing. Like I forget what I was saying to her once when she was just at my apartment after she like bought me food or whatever. But there was like some time when she was here and I just like said something about something that I did when I was like six or seven mm -hmm. about uh, having to do with getting and trying to get away from it, from my dad. And she just like stops and looks at me and she's like, how long was he doing that to you? And it, it was like her like, realizing and like and it's like a thing of like even though there's like many years that i can remember her like not knowing and because i can remember hiding it from her and knowing that she didn't know and trying to like say things to try to get her to get it without actually saying it because i didn't because you don't want to do that <laughs> um but like it not really like the but the idea not like getting across the way that i wanted it to um, so I remember those years, but it's still like a thing of like, when you're a kid, you just think that your parents know everything that you know at a certain point. And so when she said that, I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> like I did, it didn't even occur to me until this moment that she didn't, that she didn't know how young all of that stuff actually started because mm -hmm. she didn't until I said that. And it's like, oh crap. <laughs> so some, sometimes stuff like that happens where you do it accidentally. Um, but it's also a thing of like, I don't need to tell her every tiny little detail of what happened for her to know that it was really bad. And it's yeah. that sort of a thing of like, it feels like, I don't know, it just feels gross in a weird way to like, sit there and be like trauma dumping on them about this stuff. And it's like, that's not actually, it's that whole thing of why people feel like they need to trauma dump in the first place. Like you don't need to like, display like the worst things that ever happened to you and turn your life into like a sideshow of traumatic like details in order for people to care about what happened to you mm -hmm. and that's kind of how i look at it in this with like percy like he doesn't have to sit there and tell his mom like all the things that gabe did because she knows enough to know how bad it was and it is like one of the scenes that um, I remember when I read The Lightning Thief a million years ago for the first time that made me really like the book series because of how Rick Riordan wrote it. It's just such a small thing, but he like realizes that his mom was abused by Gabe because he sees her like flinch mm -hmm. when Gabe is talking to her and that's it. That's all that happens. He sees her flinch and that's that's enough for him to know like what happened and that's enough for him to know that no, he was hurting her too, and I feel stupid because I believed him when he said that he wouldn't. But it's yeah. like, what other choice do you have in that situation? You want to believe that they actually are telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. But that's like such a, that's one of those tiny little details that Rick Riordan put in that I was like, oh, you actually know what you're talking about. Yeah. When it comes to this stuff. <laughs> because yeah. not only is it normal for you to flinch, but it's also normal that when you're in a kid being abused that you would notice something like that and then put all of that stuff together without anyone actually saying anything out loud. He just like figured that out without his mom ever having to tell him anything. Yeah. It's so sad to think of baby Percy thinking like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's still very much a baby. I know he's 11 here, but, uh, or probably a little older than 11 at that point. Um, Chapter seven also is kind of heartbreaking too. Um, it's called When You Scream That It's Not Fair. And this, I have to imagine, is right after Titan's Curse. Yeah. Yeah. So Sally um, wakes up in the middle of the night hearing like silent sobbing coming from Percy's room. And um, she she remarks at how she's like instinctively going to him, kind of like how you do with a baby. Um, she starts thinking back to like when he was a baby 
I would somehow wake and then he would wake and he'd look for me for a second and then he'd start crying. Um, I mean, weird shit like that does happen, you know, like with your kids where it's like, I, I can hear William at, in the middle of the night, even if I'm dead asleep kind of thing. Um, and so she goes to him um, and she starts hugging him. But Percy at this point has already been through three quests. And he freaks out when she hugs him and he starts reaching for a weapon and she's she's like, oh, shit, like, I can't believe he's having this reaction. And so she grabs him a little harder because he's trying to pull away once he realizes it's her. He's like, I'm so sorry. Um, she's like, no, it's OK, like holding him in tighter. And Percy just kind of lets it all go at this point. He's crying, I hate this. He's talking about how he doesn't want to be the prophecy kid. Um, like he he mentions Talia joined the hunters to get away from it. Um, you never really think of Bianca as a prophecy kid because of, you know, like she is lost um before before we get to actually knowing she's a Hades kid. But um he mentions her as like it could have been her. Nico ran away, um, and even Sally goes through these people in her mind as well. Like, I wish I could grab and shake Talia. I wish I could somehow bring Bianca back. I wish that I could make Nico magically older than Percy, but I can't. Yeah. Yeah, I really like this part, even though it's hard. I like it because there's no way that Percy didn't have a meltdown like this. Mm -hmm. Because it's like... He's 14 at the end of Titan's Curse. It's like, what the fuck is he supposed to do besides have a moment like that? Especially the parts where he was like, everyone likes Salia so much more than me. Why can't she just do it? Mm -hmm. Like, that's something that I have thought many times before about many different people that I've known. Like, why am I the one doing this? Why can't somebody else do it who, act who people actually like instead of instead of me who like people usually don't like and it's that sort of feeling of like why am i the one doing this everyone else would be better at this than me but i'm somehow the one that ended up doing it and like we're, we'll talk about this more in depth in like in battle of the labyrinth because especially with ironically the after the calypso chapter um because like when you especially when you get to after that chapter there literally is no one else who could do it at that point. Like, obviously, Bianca is dead. Thalia can't, like, physically can't do it. And she would be a bad choice to do it anyway because she might turn bad <laughs> if, if she did it. Um, Nico is, like, so young. But also, Nico is, like, not, like, exactly, like, mentally, emotionally, like, stable like that he's very angry especially in that book like he's doing he's doing things against percy in that book and things like that he's not at camp he doesn't want to be at camp um and so he's not someone that the gods would feel probably very good about being like the prophecy kid mm -hmm. he's literally the only other person besides percy like if percy doesn't do it they literally have no one else anyone else would be a huge risk like nico would be a big risk of if it would even be successful in the way that percy is not and so it's like there he literally is the only one that could do it and it's just this su such an ironic thing that most of them don't like him but he's somehow he's somehow the one that has to do it and it's like are you kidding me and it like of course he would have a moment like there's only so much you can feel that sort of pressure without having like a total meltdown mm -hmm. and it just freaking out. And um, there's another fan fiction by a completely different author that I like where, and it's like that fan fiction is like Annabeth finding him at camp, just having like a gigantic panic attack, like right around the time of the last book before everything starts. Mm -hmm. Her like realizing that he's been like panicking about his birthday and just like trying to hide it from everybody. And even when she finds him, he like tries to play it off as like, oh, I'm fine. And she's like, shut up. Like you can't, you're like crying so much that you can't even breathe right now. Let me comfort you because he like doesn't even want her to do that because he's like, I have to be the one to handle all of this stuff. 
and he's like trying to be strong for everybody but it's that whole thing of there's only percy has to have somebody that he can act like a kid with still and that's um that's sally and so with sally he can cry and almost throw like a temper tantrum like sort of meltdown moment of just screaming about like can't somebody else just freaking do this like yeah like why me doing this <laughs> yeah and i mean sally she hates it too she feels like this this amount of responsibility shouldn't be on him he should be worrying about homework and stupid stuff like that um but she also is thinking to herself who else could it be and like um one of the quotes that i wrote down from this is percy was good in a way that few beings were mortal or not so um she just she recognizes that about percy that like he is the best person to do this because of how good he is and like where he's coming from and um I think the author forgot that the gods didn't like him because she also was like, and I think everybody would agree with me, that, like, they didn't, sorry, sorry to burst your bubble there, Sally, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it is true, though. I mean, we can see that as, as the audience of the book, that, like, he is that good, and there really is nobody else who should be holding that much weight. Yeah, the, when she said, like, the line that she said about how he's just, like, a like a good person in a way that other people sometimes aren't it re it like reminded me of the thing you say when you talk to me about being like a scapegoat or being like the only one to deal with like family stuff is that you always say to me that like it's not for the weak <laughs> like doing that is not for like somebody who's weak and it, like remember that about yourself before you start thinking that you're like a weak little bitch <laughs> basically but it's like that sort of idea of like yeah is that sort of thing of most other characters, even in the world of Percy Jackson, could never handle the pressure and expectation and everything that he is under from the time that he's introduced into this world. You have to be really resi resilient and really strong in order to put up with something like that, and not everybody can do it. Um, he can, and it means that he has to deal with like the fallout of actually experiencing all of these things in the way that we do when you're the one trying to break generational trauma in your family you are the one like doing that as well because that is what he's doing in this story too um it is really hard and it's not for like the weak at heart at all because if it is you're just gonna stop because yeah. it's really difficult but at the same time when you get through it all there are like a lot of rewards to it but it is also a thing I can't even count the amount of times in the last like six years that I've been like, why the fuck is it me? Like, what is wrong with all of you people on both sides of my family that this is somehow like down to just me? Like me? Yeah. Like, how is this? How is it me? Like, why am I the one doing this? Like, all these generations of people never could get their shit together long enough to figure this out. I'm somehow the one that has to do it because like my childhood went like the worst it possibly could and so i have no choice but to be the one to deal with it like couldn't just one of you <laughs> done this before i was born so i didn't have to be the one to do it yeah that would have been a lot easier but they but that that's just not what happened but you do have those moments where you're just like looking like me looking at like my family trees and looking at all of them i'm like what the fuck is wrong with all of you guys like all of you all yeah. of literally all of you none of you none of you are safe from me <laughs> like when i die one day i'm just gonna like go down the list and be like what the fuck happened to you like where where did you drop the ball oh you're in like the civil war i don't care like, i was in war in my in my house like i i had to go to school mm -hmm. also experiencing war like things at least you got to like go to war and not have to go to class anymore <laughs> yeah and it's just you can't help but have those moments where it's just like how is this possibly how is this possibly me like out of everyone me i'm not that special how am i the one doing this <laughs> and nobody else could yeah um so he percy's saying i can't do this 
Sally says you can, you don't have a choice, which like that one, that one really hit hard. Um, and yeah, um, so it also says um, she cannot fight monsters or help him there, but she could give him a safe place to land somewhere to be the child he still was. And then Percy cries himself to sleep while she's still holding him. <laughs> yeah. It's really frustrating to like read, but at the same time, like you said, it's it's the breakdown we never see between the books. It's it, I mean, we don't get a lot of his life at home when he's, you know, happy and good. <laughs> um but um the next chapter picks up it's after the prophecy is over. And so Paul I think he's living with them. It's like a little unclear from this. And um, so Percy is like, he sees him leaving with a bag and he's like, where are you going? Paul says, I want to give you and your mom some time to yourself. So um, I'm taking off, but save me some pizza. And um, like, then Sally is like, yeah, we were going to make pizza. And um, let's see. So at this point, Percy just wants his mom, but at the same time, he really loves and respects Paul. Like, we already see that. There's a hug that happens. He's remarking that Paul is the type of person that just really cares about him, that, like, wants the best for him, and it's very parental already. Yeah. Um, let's see. So sally says to him at one point during the scene um you deserve so much more we've asked too much of you and percy tells her all you've ever asked is that i stay safe um and yeah hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i know that she directly has never asked anything but i think like the collective we she's talking about, he's not recognizing because he's like, well, you're my safe person. and You've never asked me to do anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like adults in general. One, yeah. one part from this uh, part that I liked with Paul was that he said that when Paul like approached him to like sit on the couch and explain to him why he was leaving, the line was like, he like telegraphed all of his movements so which i like very or and percy says like i appreciated that and i was like yeah those are like the best people <laughs> um who are very like open with what they're doing so that you're not afraid of what they're about to do mm -hmm. that, that like stops the ptsd things from happening when you can like watch them like that without being afraid of what they're gonna surprise you with but it's just like little details like that are like things that we do when you have that like in your mind that that I don't think most people know we do <laughs> unless you've like had to do it before you just don't know that you're always watching people like that and if somebody is like seeming like they're trying to hide what they're going to do or whatever you're just immediately on guard and you don't even know why mm -hmm. you just you just are and so I like that little detail because Paul would be somebody like that who would be very open with that stuff because he would know that Percy would want, like, want that to, especially because he's sitting there trying to explain to him why he's like leaving the like the home for a couple days without like making Percy feel like it's his fault. Yeah, which was basically that conversation. Um, but yeah, I I always like stories with fan fictions like this after the prophecy is over. That there's a lot of them that talk about um like. Percy being around Sally and Paul and them treating him like somebody that's his own age mm -hmm. after he just like went through what he did and it almost like makes him like almost like slaps him in the face a little bit with how they're treating him like a child when nobody else does and yeah. it always like gets a reaction out of him because yeah that's what this scene is like him making pizza with his mom and making jokes and Paul like being willing to like stay at his sister's for a couple of days just so that he can have time alone with his mom after everything he went through. Like, um, the fifth book is super brutal with him and nobody else like treats him like that. And especially like the aftermath of it all too. Um, mm -hmm. He doesn't really get like much time 
to just be a, a kid and and like understand what just happened to him like not only does all those things that happened to him are really traumatic they all happen on his birthday yeah and so it's like he hates his birthday like in um the latest book that just came out there's like some offhand line about like oh i don't have that many mortal friends and all of the friends from camp usually go home by my birthday and plus because of you know all the chronos war stuff i just i never celebrate my birthday and i hate my birthday and i was like yeah i hate my birthday too i don't even know why i just do yeah but like it's just that sort of a thing of that would be really hard to ha not only have all that stuff happen but have it be on a day like that so you have to like remember it every single year on your birthday um so that was like i always like those like post stories like this that show sally and paul trying to get him to be more of a kid even though he like doesn't get most of the time what they're trying to do because he is so used to at that point trying to be a little adult mm -hmm. and um we know he's already under another prophecy i don't remember the the second prophecy if that was in the last olympian um it is because it it's like the very end of the book the next like like rachel like pukes out like the next prophecy that is the heroes of olympus books mm -hmm. and, and it, like of course as soon as it happens it's like dear god <laughs> again yeah yeah and like can it and but it's like also a thing of at least how those books happen it's like they, that book ends with them being like well maybe it won't happen for a while because the original prophecy was during world war ii and it didn't actually happen until like 2009 or 2010 or something um, but of course it happens four months later. Yeah. Um, so Percy says, I can't do this again, meaning the second prophecy. And all Sally says is I know. And then Percy's just like, so pizza. <laughs> um, yes. and yeah. So they, we end the chapter on that kind of like happy moment of like, yes, this is happening again, but like, at least he's distracted doing normal boy things. And um, so chapter nine, um, it's called You'll Feel My Fingers Down Your Back. And it starts out with a 17 year old Percy and Sally and Poseidon kind of looking over him as he's sleeping. And um, so Poseidon asks Sally, do you regret it? And she says, it brought me him. He's worth anything. Um, but I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive you, though. <laughs> And um, so then Poseidon asks her, what was your line in the sand? Like, what was the thing that, you know, made you so mad at me? And she says, when he was taken from me, which like goes back to, I'm guessing it's Heroes of Olympus stuff that I haven't read, but um, she mentions that Annabeth came to her crying so bad. It took her an hour to calm Annabeth down long enough to figure out like it's because Percy's gone and when he came back to her he was broken in her words yeah he is mm -hmm. um and like yeah the way that he disappears in those books is like the everything with um with you know Luke and stuff happens on his birthday which is August 18th I think mm -hmm. and then it's like three months Four, maybe four months later in um like the middle of December he they're you know he's just like at camp like they were all those months because like half of camp is dead and so they're just like rebuilding cabins and trying to help all the kids that are there and trying to rebuild everything and after everyone is gone and um he goes to bed one morning and then they wake up the next day and he's just gone and he's gone for six months nobody knows where he is for six months and like the first heroes of olympus book is annabeth like losing it because he's just the rest of the camp is too honestly but especially her because he's just he just disappears and they can't find him anywhere they like look every, they're constantly like everyone is like Thalia is looking for him, Annabeth is looking for him, Grover, they all just like drop what they're doing to go and look for him. Like Clarice doesn't even want them to look for other demigods because they should be looking for him instead. And so it's like everyone's trying to find him and he just disappears for six months because Hera's a stupid bitch. 
and stole him and and um shoved him into like like a like a shed thing in the middle of like the forest in California and he wakes up with no memory of anything and he has no money and nobody is there to help him like the other kid from like the other camp that also woke up he woke up at like a school around a bunch of other kids and so he was fine Percy wakes up completely like there's these I forget what they are but there's like a mon like dangerous monster things that are chasing him and in one of the things that happening in those books is that the monsters are like coming back to life like super fast and so he has no idea who he is or what he's doing he has no memory of anything and these monsters keep attacking him and they keep like he fights the same monsters like three times before he gets to like the camp he's supposed to be getting to and it's honestly like a fucking miracle that he gets there alive because he doesn't have any he's like eating garbage because he doesn't have any food like most of that that first book he wakes up and he's eating gar like food out of the out of dumpsters because he doesn't have any doesn't have any money and he doesn't he doesn't even know who he is like he doesn't remember anything about his life at all um and so that's such a traumatic way to experience that and then the stuff that happens in here is a, like and then when he does remember everything he just wants to go home like everything with luke happened three months ago and now he's in the middle of and now he wakes up and finds out that he was in a coma for six months and six months of his entire life is just gone and now he has to do all of this stuff all over again okay. and literally that whole series is him just wanting to go home and thinking about how much he misses his mom and Paul and he just wants to go home and doesn't imagine most of the time that he will ever see home again. And so like after Heroes of Olympus, him and Annabeth are like really messed up. And um, especially because the general plot of that series is that the gods are not there at all. Like it's they it's something to do with because they're being aware of like the Roman camp. And mm -hmm. so they keep switching between like their Roman side and like their Greek side. And so they're basically like freaking out so much that none of them are like, they're all basically like losing it basically because they're like too aware of like the other side of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so everything is going on during those, like when the thing I remember actually from House of Hades, which shows how much this pissed me off because I hardly remember anything at all from the House of Hades books particularly. <laughs> And that's the book when Annabeth and Percy are in, are in Tartarus, um, is that one of the monsters down there is like taunting Percy and is like, oh, is your daddy going to save you? And they somehow get like find out that Poseidon like can't go down there and save him. And it's like, dude, really? Like you're a big three god and you won't go down to Tartarus to save your son? Like what what like point is it? What point are you? Like this, this is like is a for can't because I was under the impression the only Olympian that can go down there besides Hades is Hermes. I don't know, but yeah. it, it's but it's also just a thing of like because of everything that's happening with him, it's like what is the point of you that like he is having to go through with all of this stuff all the time because you had him. Yeah, and then this is like the time when he desperately needs help or like break a fucking rule, but. Mm -hmm. you, just won't do it and you just leave him down there um to like deal with it on his own like again so it's like what is the point of going through having you as a father when you're never actually there to actually help him when he actually needs it um and so i that's why i appreciate like sally in this chapter being so done with him yeah because he's saying things like i'm gonna keep him safe now he has my love um and sally's like it's a little late for that um and she mentions she doesn't regret her fling with Poseidon, but she um, she blames him for everything that Percy has to go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's always having to like prove himself in in this way because he's Poseidon's kid, mm -hmm. and that's not anything that he had any control over. And it's just very unfair that he has so much on him in a way that he can't control. And Poseidon can't be there to actually help him with any of it. And it's just like, 
not really around. And so it's like, why do I have to deal with all of this extra stuff because of who my dad is when I don't get anything out of this at all? Besides just like more garbage. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, yeah, that's nice beside him that you love him, but I don't really know what that actually is supposed to mean at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and, like, apparently what it's supposed to mean is no more prophecies and no more quests unless he wants to go on one, which, like, okay, that sounds like bare minimum at this point. Um, <laughs> let's see, and also, um, so Sally tells him, you don't deserve Percy's love, like, straight in his face, knowing she's saying this to God, she's like, you don't deserve him. And she knows at this point that Percy does love him in his own way. And so she's saying this with all of the spite. And he's just like, yeah, he doesn't. Um, let's see. He says, Percy is far too kind. He gets it from you. And Sally's still just like not putting up with this bullshit. She's just like, okay. Um, Sally replies that he's better than both of them. Um, she also, the, the line that kind of like puzzled me was like, she's like, there's some cruelty to him, some steal. And Poseidon says, well, he got that from both of us. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he kind of had to be, it was a survival tactic. We know that Percy genuinely is a kind and moral person. Yeah. And especially in those books, he has to be like that sometimes because mm -hmm. he isn't, then everyone's going to die. So like. And in that book series, especially, it's literally like he has to be like that sometimes or every or he's going to die and mm -hmm. Annabelle is going to die. And then everyone else is going to die because they didn't do something they were supposed to do to help save everybody. And... Yeah. <laughs> so it's like he has no choice but to like be like that. He hates it. Like he mm -hmm. absolutely hates it in that book. Like. One thing I think is funny with the Heroes of Olympus book series is I didn't read the last one for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Part of that was because I didn't want it to end, but most of that was because I knew going into it that there wasn't a chapter from Percy's perspective. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, that's like the main thing that people don't like about Blood of Olympus. But also, now that I'm like think really thinking about it, I'm glad that he didn't write a, 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 a chapter from Percy's perspective because the entire chapter would just be like, I remember somebody left a comment on one of my videos like this. The entire chapter would just be him thinking over and over again. I hate myself. I want to die. And I'm like, that literally would be the entire chapter of his perspective would just be him saying that he deserves to die. And yeah. because that's like where he is in that book. Like he, he kind of like tries to passively do that in in that book at a certain point and so i'm like actually i'm kind of glad that rick riordan didn't make us read that because it would be absolutely horrendous because that's how he's feeling at that point mm -hmm. in that book and that <laughs> to go back to like why people hate calypso so much she without you don't know what any of this stuff means necessarily but she lies to one of the other kids um the new one of the newer characters and says that percy did something that he never actually did and that character comes back after being on her island and yells at percy when she when he's like super suicidal and doesn't want to be alive and he's and is like it's your fault that she was trapped there how dare you forget about her and and things happen with her that hurt them when they're in Tartarus and stuff too, without explaining what that is. It doesn't matter. It's just something where you literally want to jump into the book and like stab her to death when that happens, because it's the most ridiculous thing that you could ever do to Percy for her to do that to him at that and make that happen to him. And he gets out and he's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever. And, and the guy, the kid is like yelling at him about something that never happened, but he just says like, I'm sorry. And just says that it's his fault, even though it's not. Um, and when you're reading it, you like want to jump into the book so hard because it's from the other kid's perspective. And he's like, yeah, that went really well. I stood up to Percy and you're like, no, <laughs> like you're wrong. Why are you yelling at him when he's like barely even functioning right now? He, you could come up to him and tell him he's responsible for, like, the president dying, and he would be like, you're right, it's my fault, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> like he thinks everything is his, is his fault at that point. And it's just like, that's why people hate her so much just because I'm like, why are you kicking him when he's down? Like, what is wrong with you, you weird ass woman? <laughs> but yeah, um, Poseidon definitely deserves to get no shit from Sally the rest of his life just for the stuff that Percy had to go through and everyone else that loves him had to go through watching him afterwards, after Heroes of Olympus. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord. So uh, we get then um, Poseidon leaves, kisses him on the forehead and was like, you know, I, I really do love him kind of situation, but <laughs> you can't help but also feel mad at him, even the way it's written. It's just like, why do you feel any sort of possessiveness over this kid? You haven't been there for this whole time, and now you're saying you're going to be there, and we're supposed to believe you? Like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be there, dude. Yeah, so, um, final chapter is, I know you're strong enough to, and this starts off with Sally apologizing to Percy, like, after everything's gone down and saying he, he deserved better. And Percy thinks back to the toddler memory we had in the first chapter of him stomping around in the puddle and stuff and splashing with her. And he's um, he's still kind of scared, apprehensive about what's going to happen in the future because although his dad has said no more quests, no more prophecies, he can't trust what the gods say. He's learned that the hard way. Um, and so... Um, he does remark at that same point while thinking, I can't trust what my dad said, but I don't doubt at all that my mom loves me. Mm -hmm. And, um, so he replies to her, I had you, you were all I needed. And, um, let's see, is that, what do my notes say? <laughs> Percy knew his mom often thought of how she could have chosen the palace under the sea, and that would have meant she would have live like not lived her own life but she would have gladly done it for percy and percy thinks i would have done the same thing for her i'd give up my like living my life for her um let's see um then we get kind of a little bit of banter about estelle because they are hanging out but baby estelle is laying and they're watching her on the monitor and Percy um, says something about her, and then Sally says, oh, well, you were a saint of a baby compared to Estelle. You slept a lot more. And, like, Percy says, well, sleep's too great to pass up on. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. Uh, he also is thinking in this chapter how he's somewhat jealous of Estelle because she has a present dad who loves her. She's never going to have to doubt that Paul cares about her. Mm -hmm. She has enough food. She's not going to have to worry about being in a cold apartment in New York in the winter. <laughs> like, yeah. And um, so while he's happy she gets all of these things, there's also that pain of jealousy behind it a little bit. Yeah. And I, I like that being there just because that is like a thing. Like you don't want, you don't want like the younger generation whoever it is whether it's your sister or like with me like a niece or a kid or whatever you don't want them to go through what you did but it is hard especially considering like how much better her childhood will be than his mm -hmm. it is just hard to know that like that her life is going to be so much easier in all of those ways and like he's glad about that but it is also one of those things that he's always a part of that family like he's obviously a part of that family no matter what but mm -hmm. it is like one of those things that just makes you feel different um than than everyone else and it's it's just just difficult because everyone else in that family is like mortal <laughs> just yeah. you're like a normal person um and will live like very normal lives when he's not when he's not there which like good that's good for like him to be around people like that too but it is very hard when you're it's hard to be around people that remind you how abnormal like your life has been mm -hmm. it's just very difficult to be around people like that even if you like 
to be around them. It's hard being around people like that, that just, just little things that they don't even notice just makes you feel really weird. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like with parenting too, it definitely, you feel something when your kids start going through the ages that you were when your trauma happened, because you start thinking, wow, I was that small. Like I was that young. Um, and for me with like William, he still acts like a kid. He still very much plays pretend and like, there's something so innocent about him that I know wasn't there for me anymore by this age. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's beautiful in a way, but it's also sad when I stop to think about it. Yeah, I do that too. Like, um, it's hard for me to be around kids that are a little bit older. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm not a good judge on how old kids are just by like looking at them because of how crazy my childhood was, I think. <laughs> And so I usually will ask them like, um, like my cousin's kids or my sister's partner's brother's kids. Like I'll ask them how old they are when I do see them. And the, and like, they're really sweet kids and it's nice to like talk to them, but it is so weird for me, especially to be talking to them and just be thinking about like what was happening to me when I was their age and like looking at them, I'm like, this is just so weird because they're so little yeah like just innocent and that's not at all how i remember myself at that age and it's just really weird to think about the stuff that was going on at that age that it's like how were you doing that with somebody who looked like that like it just is really it's a lot harder to think about it it's it's easier to know your own memories because it's the only thing that you've ever experienced in your life. So you don't know anything different, but it's different when you see other kids mm -hmm. that are those same ages and you just look at them like, that's what I looked like, like at that age, how was this stuff happening to me when I looked like that? Yeah. Just a very different feeling. And it's, I try to like control that like anxiety or whatever around kids that age because that part of my brain that's always like listening to kids to see if there's anything wrong never ever turns off but it's also a thing of i need to like not be worrying about that so much when i'm around them that it like takes me out of like spending time with kids when they're just being cute <laughs> yeah yeah um so sally keeps apologizing to him in this chapter and percy says i was strong enough to bear it um, she says, you're strong enough to do anything. I just wish you didn't have to be. And he says, I'm strong because of you. And like that moment was just so sweet, especially because she replies to him, well, you, you made me stronger too. And um, there's, there's something about growing up with your kids. Like, of course, it's not ideal to have kids when you're very, very young. But like having also had my child before my frontal cortex was fully developed, he did have to experience me growing up. Like it's, it was inevitable. And um, like you try your best, at least I would think first, uh, Sally was also this way to like not put that growing up on them, mm -hmm. but they still recognize it. You know, like there's, William will still joke, like you're living out some childishness right now because you didn't get to when you were a kid mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah i am um and i'm very honest with him about that but it's i mean he notices it he fully notices it yeah it's, i feel like it's one of those things kids notice just purely based on like you know how kids talk about stuff like that like oh how old is your mom how old <laughs> is your dad and when there are kids that when there is someone in your class that has a dad or a mom that's much older or much younger, it just is one of those things when you're a kid that is that like gets your attention. And so you notice when you're like someone whose parent is much younger than everybody else or much older than everyone else. It just like makes you realize that your parent is a little bit different from everybody else's. And it's not even like a bad thing. It just is true. It's mm -hmm. just how it is. Like my dad was old. <laughs> Yeah, like he was 35 when he had me and 37 when he had my sister. And so he was a lot older. He died when I was 29 and he was like 64 by then. 
And so he was one of the older parents when I was in, in school, when most parents were like 10 years younger than him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just one of those things. Like it's fun for William, I think, to like notice that stuff. Um, <laughs> I sometimes wonder about that with like my niece growing up because I'm gonna be more of like the childish one always. <laughs> When it comes, fun ads. Yeah, when it comes to like me and my sister, I'm definitely the one that's going to be like, have you read Percy Jackson yet? <laughs> or do you want to play with art supplies of some sort or both? Or <laughs> what do you want to do? Do you want to play? Do you want to be silly? And and things like that, which are things that my sister's not very good at. <laughs> so I'm always going to be like that because that's just because I never got to do that until I was like this age. Um, but it is one of those things of, I like the idea of doing that now because it feels more fun to do it at this age when I have, when I don't like hate every aspect of my life <laughs> and I have like control over how I want to do it and what I want to do as opposed to when I would have wanted to do that kind of stuff when I was younger. Yeah. I know that's not how you're supposed to think about that, but that's just how I think about that. <laughs> I think it's how some of us get by, you know, <laughs> I, I was, I was even talking to William about it a little bit today of like how I was trying to grow up super fast. Like my race to the finish line was, I need to find my forever dude immediately. And like, it, of course it had to be a dude because I had Christian brainwashing in my household. Mm -hmm. And so I was very much like hoping every single guy I dated would be the one, like the one. And uh, thinking that once I finally found that, that would be the thing that fixes the things like that. Finding my person was going to make me better. And but then I did find my person and I wasn't better. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I did become a mom and I wasn't better. And it's not necessarily that Jake and William don't enrich my life, but it's more just that if, if anything, being with them pushed me to work on myself. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, pop psychology is very stupid, but one pop psychology thing they do that is like based on something that's real is the whole idea of like, Oh, you can't, other people can't fix you or whatever. Like they take it to the point where, they need to be alone or something like that but it, it, it's not that it's just like somebody in your life can make you want to be happier because you want to be around them more and so you want you just because you're happy around them it makes you notice that other parts of your life aren't happy at all yeah and so that's like the actual way that happens not that you have to like be alone when you're working on yourself it's just you just notice those things because you want to feel like how you do around this person in every aspect of your life yeah um let's see so what the chapter says is percy has grown used to words of affection from paul and annabeth mm -hmm. uh, but the, when his mom says something nice to him it's like nothing else um he still very much loves his mom so much that's his favorite person and um the chapter ends with them kind of getting broken apart by estelle crying but he's not mad or sad about it he's kind of actually happy that she's going and tending to his baby sister mm -hmm. yeah this is sweet so yeah this was very sweet i have come to be very affectionate towards sally because i was so close to her age when i had william i was a tiny bit older but like it's it's basically the same age group where you're an adult but not really and um like also raising a neurodivergent kid it's something different you know like you recognize how special and how cool they are but the world doesn't always see them that way and that's sometimes hard to deal with figuring out how do you protect that uniqueness and especially like as they're going through school and kids kind of want uniformity for whatever reason um like how do you protect that in a way that doesn't like snuff that out um and 
I mean, just the, the powerlessness of being a parent, even if your kid's not fighting monsters, um, there is an aspect of like, how do I protect this little being from the big bad forces out there in the world? I mean, I you probably even feel it with Lexi, like there's so many things to worry about that like, you're not gonna be able to do anything about. No, it's like a thing of trying to, trying to get in my mind that like, I'm not responsible for fixing these problems that are going to like come up with her as she goes through life. I can't do that. And it's not actually my responsibility to do that. Um, and just trying to be there as much as I can, um, however often that happens and, and just trying to be there as a person that like, that they can talk to about whatever or just makes them feel good because i i do remember the thing i try to remember is the is like my aunt that i saw a lot when not that much actually <laughs> i was sort of like once or twice a year usually uh when i was growing up at, at the most was like twice a year but whenever i did see her i had a really nice time and so i try to remember that i was like well she had a positive effect on me because when my dad would try to peer pressure me into getting married and having children <laughs> one day when I didn't want to and was already like a grizzled 13 year old telling him that I don't want to get married and I never want to have kids and he was like you'll change your mind one day when all your friends start having kids and I was like I'm not going to get married and have kids up because of peer pressure what is wrong with you sir and <laughs> That was pretty much the exact words I said to him too, but, um, but like she wasn't married and she wasn't, she didn't get married until she was my age now and, or about to be my age when she was 40 and she never had any kids. And so she was like an example of that. So I would come home from her house and be like, Sarah didn't get married until she was 40 and Sarah doesn't have any kids and she's fine. And he would just grumble because cause like, what can he say to that she was fine she was like very happy with uh with her life um and like you know um pampering me and my sister we, we would come visit like once a year and so i try to remember that that like even if i don't see her a lot i know from experience remembering that that even if it's not a lot it still can make a big difference and it is different now because like <laughs> internet exists <laughs> a lot more like phones and like facetime calls and things like that exist that did not exist at all when i was growing up and so i feel like it'll be a lot easier to keep in touch with her no matter like where i am because of stuff like that and that does make me feel a little bit better because it is like a very overwhelming feeling just thinking about like everything that could possibly happen um yeah. a lot <laughs> that could that that could happen and I mean, Sally's approach really is all you can do. It's being a safe spot for your kid to land at, like at the, at the end of the day, like knowing that William doesn't have the stress of a dysfunctional household, no matter how bad a school day is, definitely is a comfort. Yeah, and my phone battery is gonna die soon, but yeah, I gotta get him to bed soon too. The one, the one thing I did want to say about that, though, is because I know a lot of the people who watch us probably don't have, like, happy home lives, perhaps. So I did want to say that even if your home, even if your childhood or home life or whatever isn't that great, mm -hmm. that it's, like, not necessarily ever too late for it to be better. Because I know the other day I messaged you and I was like, my dad used to terrorize my mom and me and my sister all the time. And now my mom is like texting me while she's live watching the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> and before we started doing this, her and her dude are watching all the Star Wars movies because they got Disney Plus and she was like asking me questions about Attack of the Clones <laughs> and was asking me to come over and watch their, the other movies because I know a lot more mm -hmm. and they and I could probably answer all of their questions <laughs> about stuff and I'm like, my mom used to be like terrorized by a horrible person and now she has like this nice guy that she lives with that takes her on trips and we see each other often and she says that she loves me like 47 times every time I see her and and does whatever she wants like literally will do anything like when I was telling her about us doing this podcast like just 
like two months ago or something she was like rick riordan should know who you guys are <laughs> i was like you're so sweet she's like i want you guys i want him to know who you guys are because of how much you guys like doing this stuff and it's just like i never could have imagined that we could have we could have a life like this at all like even like a year ago i wouldn't have ever thought that i be seeing like my niece as much as i am and we would all be seeing each other and like getting along and having like a nice time and like my mom and i are like building a nice relationship with my niece that i didn't think was gonna at first it was like hard to see her and so i i wasn't sure how much we were gonna see her but we're seeing her a lot more right now and it's really nice to see that happening to know that she'll have other people to go to and stuff like that because that didn't happen at all when when i was a kid like we my grandma was around but like once a month but that was only like once a month <laughs> And so we weren't seeing her like every single week, like we've been seeing her lately. And so I guess I just wanted to say something like that about how even if things are really bad right now, you never know how things could work out in the future. Because I never, ever would have thought a year ago that my mom would be texting me about like talking shit about the Great British Bake Off not knowing how to bake Mexican food <laughs> and like in between like asking me if I want to go to an art museum or like asking me to what art supplies I need so she can buy me some for Christmas and things like that. Mm -hmm. And also like asking me excitedly every single week what we talk about on our Percy Jackson podcast. <laughs> yeah. And like asking me like, when do you do that? Because I don't want to schedule plans when you're doing that <laughs> and, <laughs> and things like that. And so it's, you never know what can happen if you just like stay around long enough to see what will happen. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's what I want to say. You never know how much better your family life can get when the evil goes away. Mm -hmm. We. <laughs> yeah, hopefully permanently, like in your case. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> yes, um, but I do have to get going. I have to get William to bed. Um, for next week, we are going to start watching Epic. And I... I don't know how much we want to cover necessarily for this first one. Um, so me and you will talk offline about that, but yeah. we're, well, we're going to do a few of them probably. Yeah, there's, a bunch, there's a bunch of sagas. Every saga has like three or four, five songs at the most. Mm -hmm. So just for like our viewers, the best way we know how to do that is that we'll listen to it and see basically see how many songs we get to before we think we have enough to talk about mm -hmm. and we'll probably post somewhere during the week to like let you guys know because i know some people like to like keep up with what we're doing mm -hmm. um to let you guys know which ones we're going to cover but either way we're going to cover that okay. because if a bunch of people are like i don't like your opinion and i don't have to listen to it because i've never listened to epic i'm like i'm going to listen to it now thanks yeah and i've been having people say oh you should listen to it for a while I, I, I have too like i've had people say that for like ever since percy jackson ended in like february there's been people uh who ended up seeing my video since like march or something telling me to do it i just didn't do it because i it felt i thought that it was a lot more than it actually is like i didn't realize the sagas were so short because it felt i thought it sounded like overwhelming to like catch up and then yeah. i was like oh this is much easier than I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we will be in touch with everybody on our, our TikTok accounts, probably most likely with news on how much we're doing. And for next week, epic. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye.